pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that if you're not satisfied with a decision made by the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Uh, Mr. Field circulated to the commission ahead of today's meeting the draft minutes from last month. Have the commissioners had a chance to review those minutes? Is there a motion regarding regarding approval? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. We have two public hearings today. The first is a review of a request for a taxi cab fare increase. Mr. Fields. The uh, taxi cab industry for several years has been considering <coughs> making a request for um, uh, increased fare. The last time there was a general increase of the fares for the tax cabs and that was 2000, uh, 2003. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a uh, small uh, fuel increase in that in a, a year or two later when, but then that was only on for a short period of time. So they're making a request. Uh, their proposal is in your package and many representatives are here to be able to speak to you about it. You do have the authority by rule to establish the fares. Um, at this point in time, we will open uh, the public hearing to hear from members of the public. Do we have uh, requests to speak submitted? But they're here, but I have to just ask them to stop. <laughs> All right. So if you'll please raise your hand if you'd like to speak on the issue of increasing uh, the uh, taxi fares. Sir, please come forward and introduce yourself. Using city to take a cab. Thank you. Uh, I've got a little proposal also. Um, I'd like to hand it to you guys if you don't mind uh, before we go through. They actually have it. They have it? Yeah, but if you want to go and give it to them as a. Oh, as a <coughs> please. Sorry, could I have one for this? Oh, you do? Oh, you do. <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> excuse me. And today, and I'm here for, I, we do the transportation over, actually myself, I've been doing transportation for over 20 some years. So we're trying to get business better and transportation better for both sides with this cab driver, cab business, and uh, customers. So today, uh, we do have a lot of issues and to pick up our customers. And the reason, because of Uber and Lyft, they have a surcharge and they charge people <coughs> with this crazy amount of money. So our drivers, we're not able to pick up our customers and because outside of downtown, it's hard to take, take out business because it's not worth it for them to go over, for example, Bear Road and Nashville Village area, to go over there, it's stuck in traffic for over half an hour and a half to pick up $10 fare. And the customers is customers. It doesn't matter. Either way, we have to pick up those customers. But the drivers is not able to get there because of, of $10 or $15. So. We try. We have a competition. It's everywhere. It's. I mean, it's those tra those days. The market is it's crazy going up. Everything. I mean, we cannot just talking about the gas price, about the insurance, about the uh, grocery store, about the mortgages, about taxes. So today we are asking if we get this opportunity, increase this uh, meter. That will help us. We can pick up, take over the business <coughs> more than what we can. What we doing right now. Thank you so much. Is there uh, anyone else who would like to speak on the issue of increasing fares? 
some of them. Probably they was not able to make it, but we do have a dead signature. Yes, we, we do have some letters yes, here so in our packet that are circulated. Yes, sir. Commissioners, do we have any uh, questions uh, to Mr. Hassan? Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. At this point in time, we'll close the public hearing on the uh, request to increase the taxi cab fare so the commissioners can decide uh, the issue. So under the uh, rule, it looks like uh, we as a commission must approve any request for proposed fare increases. Uh, it's under our CLC rules, rule number four. Can I ask the director to brief us on exactly what the current rates are <coughs> and what they're asking for? It, it's it's reasonably straightforward. The, the current rate is a $3 meter full. In other words, when you get in the cab, it's three. Right. And then they charge 20 cents a tenth, which ends up being $2 per mile. Okay. The flat rate from downtown to Opryland and, and the triangle, is, as we call it, is a $25. Currently. Uh, currently. currently. Uh, what they're uh, suggesting, yeah, well, you see what they're suggesting. Yeah. The, uh, let me <coughs> look at the second page. The, um, the time has increased. It's 15 cents a minute. It's, the, it's currently 15 cents a minute. They're suggesting 35 cents a minute, up to $21. Now I think it's up to $16. Um, and um, so the, um, and then there, there's a little variation on the flat rate to go from the Opry Lead to West End and West right. End to Opry Land and so forth would be instead of being uh, 25 to be 35. We'll have to, we'll have to, uh, and staff can do this, we need to identify specifically where, what is West End. <laughs> uh, and oh, I know that yeah. sounds crazy, but you'd be surprised what people will come back and say, well, he just took me to Sunday. Well, that's not really West End. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, the recommendation is where the city says it's West End to the end of West End is West End. Uh, and I think that's reasonable, and that's what I would go with unless y'all were telling me something different. Uh, you know, downtown typically is considered the inner, cert the inner right. uh, core of the city with uh, the interstate making the loop around here. Okay, this talks about a surcharge during rush hour. Is there any current rate, any such thing? We do not have a surcharge. We have talked about it over the years. Uh, in terms of a possibility, but it's never really been talked about. We've talked about special event surcharges right. and uh, so forth. Is that also in here? Is that a part of this? During, yeah, I don't during major no. events. No. Yeah, it is. Where do you see that? Surcharge of $15 during rush hours, 5 to 9 and 3 to 7. Additional surcharge of 15 to 25 during major events that create high volume requests. Kerry, which, which oh, I'm sorry, it's on the you? second page of his letter. I'm looking at it on the, maybe I'm looking at a different copy. It looks like we got multiple, what multiple fair proposals. I'm looking well, at the one that what, was on What our, we've ended up having is the companies together signed, and I think there have been some changes since the original oh, signature. Okay. I was actually anticipating all the companies being present to be able to discuss it with you. Yeah, well, you you, you received two. two. You received uh, from me. You would have received a, a you received information from uh, you would receive information that was from Nash Vegas. Then you would have also received uh, a letter signed by Nash Vegas, Music City, Checker, Volunteer, Yellow, Tennessee National, uh, Ten Cab, and Magic's not si not a signatory on it. However. Uh, I've spoken with him, and Dee Dee was in approval last time I spoke with him. Well, I think the, I think everything is the same on all of them except the surcharge. I don't think. <coughs> yeah, Nash Vegas only, and they're not present. <coughs> okay. I suspect I suspect the surcharge that they were suggesting could be would be in response to um, surge pricing and such that right. uh, that exists with uh, Uber and Lyft or other uh, ride share. So that is not part of the request no, currently? No, the only, I, 
that was on the original. So one. again, you've got you've got a company suggestion, a company suggestion, then you have these that have signed together. So the one that's addressed in Senate Education Licensing Commission is the proposal that we're working off of today. Uh, I, I think what you've got are a couple of. I'm sorry. The, the only I difference between all of them are the surcharges. Okay. And you certainly could take action on part of them if you wanted to consider surcharges, which, again, we've not studied, but we certainly could, and you could come back and consider that at a later date. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just... I mean, so it seems to me that a, an increase that hasn't happened since 2003 is probably well in order. Um, as you describe it, Billy, I mean, I don't think that these increases are at all unreasonable. I mean, they're not. I, I agree. They're not reasonable to me. They're, they're not. Um, I'm not sure that I would want to go with a surcharge just so I understood the impact of it. And I say, I looked up some other comparable things where there it was, if you look at the Georgia Motor Association downtown, it <coughs> How does the waiting time work? Waiting, in other words, you want to go to the grocery store. What you do is you go to the grocery store. They start the waiting time. They're in the store. That, so the meter stops running at that moment. Then the timer is running. So that's what that's what this indication means when 35 cents per minute. is. That's waiting time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not running while they're driving. It's not. No, a, we do not allow okay. time in. Uh, New York, for instance, runs time and meter. We just run meter or time. We don't do both. There is a slight, I mean, and I didn't mean a slight increase for additional person. So the first person, the, the meter fare runs or the flat, but right. if there's an additional person under this proposal, they would go from $1 to $2 per person after the initial tax increase. that on the one that was sent to me earlier. Do yeah. we know that that's it does. You it's know right here. It, it is right. there. There it is. interested in just uh, making a motion to uh, accept the recommendation to, to increase the rates uh, on bonk go all the way down the line on this and I'm reading from the letter dated July 8 2021 to the Transportation Licensing Commission and it's signed by <coughs> Las Vegas and Eastwood City Checker Cab Volunteer Taxi Yellow Cab Tennessee National Cab and Magic Taxi and Tennessee Cab or do we have to take them individually? Um, I, in other words, if, if they, you've read them into the record. I looked through legal. I, I think you could accept them as they are. I don't think you have to do each one. In other words, you just set the fares. Would that be? Um, hang on just a sec. Okay, so 672.250 says rate schedule. Um, no owner or driver of a taxi cab shall charge a greater sum for the use of a taxi cab than the rates set below. The Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission may establish by rule maximum and minimum rates, authorized flat fares, and minimum meter actuation rates, and may by establish by rule a, an additional charge for waiting time. Waiting time shall be charged only for stops or delays positively requested by the passenger. Um, so, I mean, I think you could. I mean, it seems like these are pretty much within those parameters. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I would want you to be clear in your motion what you were adopting and what you were not adopting, like, for example, with regard to the surcharge. So if you would, like, read each one out, I think <coughs> that would probably be more clear for the record. Okay. And, and just to, so I, I'm clear, the current time per minute is 15 cents, and they want to increase it to 35? Correct. It goes from 15 <coughs> to 21. 
And from six currently it's fifteen dollars oh, for, yeah, for an hour. From twenty one yeah. to the max per hour. Yeah. And the miles go from twenty to twenty five per mile. Yeah, twenty cents to twenty five cents. Yeah. Depends. All right, so so how's it so so at some point it just maxes <laughs> out, is that what you're saying? So it's fifteen currently it's fifteen cents per minute or maximum is fifteen dollars. Well, hour. per hour. In other words, if they waited two hours, it would be thirty dollars, and so forth. So it just it. depends how right. long the cab's been out. And right. then the current proposal for to increase is thirty-five cents per minute or twenty-one dollars per hour. Per hour. So it's a maximum charge. And the only thing we would need is uh, the effective day uh, to make sure we have time because we. We require decals in each cab, so we'll have to have them printed. But what we could do in the meantime is actually print uh, cards out that uh, they could use for the cab. But we'll have to, uh, you know, get clearance because we'll have to take them off the cab because they're currently on the windows down. We'll take them off and put them back on, and then we'll know. Well, how much time are you thinking? Well, about? you know, I mean, if I had a couple of weeks to get the thing to get something printed in terms of a card of some kind, and then the. It, and then once they've got the card, that should be enough for them to uh, work with. And then in the meantime, we'll order decals. We sometimes have issues getting decals uh, printed and returned to us. Does it make sense to start at January 1st of uh, 2022? Oh, I, I, I mean, I, I'm just <coughs> I'm really thinking maybe the middle of October. Is I, I mean, give me a couple of weeks to do the cards because they're going to be happy to have the cards. It's, it's, it'll be clear. <laughs> Good because if we have to change every individual meter too. Correct. That's correct. So the meter is gonna take yeah. so much to time to, to yeah, talk, change right. everybody one by one, you know. So, yeah. and yeah. Mike's not available all, all the time. So it will be January first. I believe it will be great. Okay, thank you. You have great insight, Mr. Mallory. You're right. Meters do have to be reset and so on. I have to get a transcript of this hearing. Is that <laughs> Oh, we have another person who'd like to speak. Oh, yeah. Come on forward if you'd like to address us. The fact the rate increase. Oh, yeah, I apologize. Doug manager, Yellow Cab. Uh, I've missed everything so far. Uh, the rate increase. It's been many, many years since we've had a rate increase. I voted for rate increase in the zone, which would help the locals, the nurses going to work, stuff like that. If that was raised from $3 meter pool to 5 more drivers would not flock to the airport and, and, and make the local calls. When, when Billy set the rates for the airport, and you guys did years ago, those rates coming out of the airport, the flat rates from, from Opryland, to the airport, to downtown, to Triangle, as we call it. Those were above what it would run on the meter by the miles anyway. Uh, the other cab companies all wanted that. that that's fine. The, the zones is what I'm concerned more about, getting the local nurses to work, etc. cetera. And uh, I think that meter pull in the zone should be raised from three to five. As far as everything else, I didn't go along with it, and I'm not. I mean, it's, it's fine at, at the flat rates that's installed by the city and the licensing commission and you members. I've always thought it was fine. It, it has been a long time since we've had an increase there, too. You know, a couple dollars. I don't think it ought to go from 25 to 35. A couple dollars there would be fine. But the zones is what I'm concerned about, getting the locals picked up to work such as the nurses and, and et cetera. That meter pull to drive from where the cabs <coughs> sit and work to go to Nolanville Road in Hardy or to Bellevue or anywhere in this county to get somebody picked up. That meter pull is $3. It's been there forever. More drivers would go to the, the outskirts of the county and get our locals to work if that meter pull was raised from three to five. Everything else, I'm not really concerned about. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Trimble, you're, you're in favor of increasing 
the meters in the zones, the the non flat fares is what you're talking about. Correct. And the flat fares are you would be fine just keeping them in B. Couple dollars. I don't I don't I don't think it'll be raised to high dollars. Couple dollars on the per it's called the triangle. Those flat rates are from the airport to downtown or to Opryland. Anywhere in that triangle to and from is that flat rate plus a dollar for every passenger over the first passenger. All right. So if you got uh you got a $25 flat rate from downtown to the Hilton and you got four people, it'd be $28. I think that the dollar per person should be raised from one to two. I mean, we hear about Uber and Lyft charging $200 on, on their surge fees and stuff like that. If you got five people in a taxi, that flat rate of $25, I think $1 is a little low. I think the extra passenger charge should be two. And the meter pool should be in the zones on the outskirts away from the triangle should be raised from three to five. That's going to get the nurses to work to Vanderbilt because more cabs are going to not be so concerned about driving to Nolan Road and Harding or, or a 65 and Dickerson Road. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that, that's really needed badly. As far as the flat rates, not too concerned about that. That could be raised a, a couple bucks. So the extra passenger fees should be raised from one to two, and the meter pool in the zones, as we call them, should be raised from three to five. That's what I'm in favor for. Any questions that I can help you guys give you any insight at all on anything you need to know about this situation? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I ask a question. Is it make illegal? Yeah. Is, there any, is there any standard that we have to meet like we have on the other things of public necessity and convenience for raising the rates? Um, the I'm not that I'm aware of. I mean, pretty much um, the language that I read to you from the code is all it says about this. Um, uh, okay. No, that's fine. It does actually say that the Metropolitan Transportation Transportation Licensing Commission may authorize a surcharge for special events in accordance with commission rules. Mm -hmm. And you can authorize a temporary fuel sur surcharge, like if you're in a gas crisis, I guess. Based on your question, do you have some concerns or suggestions regarding the increase on the, uh, it was described as the triangular area? No, I, I just was trying to make sure I understood Mr. Trimble on, on that point. Yeah. It, it sounds like they're, they're in pretty much the unity case, between, yeah. amongst the companies that the metered fares need to be increased. The flat rates maybe should be increased. Um, the exact amount, you know, it sounds like there's not a complete consensus, but pr pretty close. Um, on some addressing it somehow, um, but okay. the metered fares seem to be where they they had the greatest uh, concern on the increasing and the additional person per vehicle charge. Yeah. And I noticed Mr. Trimble had signed off on this letter as well. So you did? Partially. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not how it works. <laughs> I signed off on it partially, but we're, me and the other cab companies are not in agreement, totally, and I'm going to explain to you why. Mr. Fields can attest to this. Those flat rates that come out of the airport to downtown or to Opryland, vice versa of those three, the triangle, Billy, when those were installed, they were 3 and $4 or $5 more than the meter would run. They were higher, they were set higher back then. If you went by the meter rate at two, at, per mileage from downtown at 5th and Broadway, the airport, it would not run $25. Still, those were set higher then. I'm not in agreement that those should be changed because if you change the airport flat rate to downtown or to Opryland, guess what? You're going to have more cab drivers flock to that airport and sit downtown and at Opryland because their flight rate has gone from 25 to 30 or 35. 
it's going to give us no more cabs at 24 and Hardy or Dickerson and 65 or Bellevue to get our nurses and our locals to work. And I've got a bunch of them that depends on me to get to work. You raise those flat rates, you ain't doing nothing but sending more cabs to the airport. They don't need no more cabs out there. They got plenty. They got six, seven ways of transportation out there. So I'm not in agreement with the other companies. I signed off on it, not fully, but uh, we had a difference of opinion. My opinion is the meter increase in the zones from three to five, the extra passenger free from from one to two. That's it. Thank you for that any, uh, any explanation. Any questions that I could help you all with? I'm just. I have a question about this proposal. And I'm trying to read it correctly, but one, two, three, <coughs> four, five down on there, it says airport to Opryland, $30. And then two more down there, it goes airport or Opryland to West End, that's $35. Okay. And then West End to Opryland or airport is $35. Is that because there's an additional, that's more distance? It's further. It's been more distance. Okay. It, it, we, we ended up, as we call it, it, it ended up with two triangles. That's what it would amount to. Yeah. Not that much more. Or a hexagon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but well, let's not get into 10th grade geometry. Yes. B Billy, can I ask Billy a question? Uh, in the past, hadn't the Convention Bureau and Downtown partnership, haven't they had an interest in the airport fees? Do they? I think historically <clears throat> they have. I think since 2015, with the advent of uh, yeah. Uber and network companies, Uber, Lyft, and, and Rideshare, yeah. I think that's that's changed the entire landscape. Yeah. Uh, there was a time where the cabs were our transportation. I still think they should be our transportation <laughs> because they adhere to a, a pretty strict standards. There are issues we have, and they know those issues that I share with them. So, you know, I want to reward them. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I actually see both sides of it because it's really interesting. There's a, there's a break point where where's that tipping point where it's too much and it's unreasonable because if you run, and, and, and Doug was right, back when we set the flat rate in, 2003, I think, was the first time we said it. It uh, we ran meters. Just I mean, I had two or three different. I said, go run a meter, bring it back, and uh, and it was it was I want to say it was uh, the 25 was two or three dollars more than if you just ran a meter. But there was also it's also a relatively, I mean, they're they're looking for the home runs. What they're looking for, they want the the run to Clarksville. Or, you know, and they all want a $30 fare, a $25 fare. And that's one of the issues we have with, with drivers. They'll charge a flat rate when there's not a flat rate. So anything we can do to encourage them to follow these rules, because many of them now can't speak for every cab driver. I can speak for the ones that have come to see me. You know, they are unhappy with, uh, with uh, the system, not necessarily us as a system, but the, the Ubers and the Lyfts that, mm -hmm. you know, they, they see a lot of money being made. And a lot of former cab drivers are Uber and Lyft drivers yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and right now we have a, a lot of drivers that have left the business that we have been uh, citing over the last couple of weeks down on Broadway for operating as a taxi cab without being a taxi cab so um, excuse my ignorance but I assume Uber and Lyft don't have some standard fare from the airport is that their demand based it, it fluctuates with whatever the, right. the surge whether there's a surge right. you know the one time to the nine time okay. they have some proprietary <clears throat> algorithms mm-hmm Well, I'll make a motion. Um, before us are looks like 11 individual rate increases for cab drivers, and I would move to approve all 11, and I'll articulate them. That would be number one, a meter pull increase to $5, airport to downtown $30, downtown to airport $30, downtown to Opryland $30, airport to Opryland $30, Opryland to airport or downtown $30, airport or Opryland to West End, with it being defined up to Interstate 440, $35. West End, again, up to Interstate 440 to Opryland or Airport, $35.
an increase in the miles rate of 25 cents per tenth of a mile or a maximum of $2.50 per mile. Time, 35 cents per minimum or a maximum of $21 per hour. And then an increase of the additional person to $2 per person. And I think since it's been since 2003, these are modest, in my opinion, very modest increases in the rate, probably below what their cost of insurance has been, or increase in insurance. Did you want to say January 1st? Oh, and with an effective date of January 1st, 2022. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We have another public hearing today. Uh, we've been asked to review a request for an emergency non-consent record rate increase. The record rates are established by the Metropolitan Council. Uh, so your role in this would be uh, making, a, if you chose to make a recommendation, there's also a couple of language issues that I think they want to talk with you about that we'd like they'd like to suggest goes into the ordinance as well. Uh, the companies, uh, the emergency companies, uh, as a group, have have worked together. I, I believe that uh, Cottons and Dads, which is Cottons and Tow Pro, and Dads in West Nashville, and anyway, they, have, they operate multiple zones. Uh, they also have run the heavy wreckers in town. So uh, they have representatives here, and there, may, and there are other representatives here as well, but they would be able to talk to you about the expenses and uh, that, that are driving this request. The, they, they had an increase three or four years ago, um, three, I think, uh, and from looking at, um, at uh, invoices and looking at bills, and looking at new regulations, the diesel changes that y'all have had to make and recoveries and all sort of interesting things that I get in their shops and don't understand most of it. Uh, they have they have concerns and, and in some ways this is actually simplifying because it's reducing some language, but there are some increases and again, they're here and they're present and be glad to speak to you. All right, if you'll please raise your hand if you'd like to speak on the issue, Mr. Mitchell. Hello, I'm Jim Mitchell uh, with uh, I'm Dad's Towing and West National Record. I'm also the president of the Davidson County Emergency Towing Association. I represent just the zone companies in town. I've spoke with many of them, and of course, they're all in favor of the increase, of course. I'd like to first go over just a few of the reasons that we have come to the, the need of this, and then I'll go over some of the obstacles that are sort of in our way that's making it a struggle to continue running. One of our main problems is, is locating and keeping employees, and our wages are up about 30% this year just to maintain the drivers that we've had. Drivers are being pursued at an unbelievable rate in many different directions, and we're losing a lot of them. Uh, our, our fuel price is, of course, y'all know what's happened to fuel in the last you know, year and a half or so. It's, it's almost doubled in diesel now. Our oil is just even worse than the fuel. Oil, which uh, diesels have to be serviced quite often, regular, or if the engines fail, the injectors fail. And it's up about 55%. Our tire cost, uh, anything related to petroleum, which the tires is, uh, has just gone completely crazy. And the worst part of that is uh, getting the tires now has become, become a problem. We're struggling on many of the items to keep our trucks running because of the uh, everybody's out of, out of parts and tires and uh, just about everything related to the operation of the vehicles, chips. Uh, Goodyear's expecting to have at least another 8% increase before the end of this year, which is not very long. Our truck costs are up more than 10% this year, and we can't buy trucks. Um, I bought two trucks this year, had six ordered, got two, have two still on order that are not expected to come by even by the end of the year. Our truck cost, and I'll, I'll show you what to, what our cost is. I brought a couple of invoices of the last two trucks I've bought. 
you know, just a few years ago, we were paying sixty-five to say seventy-two thousand for a rollback truck. You can't touch one now for under ninety-five to one hundred and five thousand dollars, depending on how well it's equipped. If you can find one, right now, um, unless you have a connection somewhere, you can't buy a rollback. There, there are none that I pursued, unless it's a used rollback. Every now and then you can find a used one somewhere, which I have purchased a used one just recently. Uh, a parts cost is up at five to seven percent. Even our coolant, uh, antifreeze coolant, which has to be serviced real regular on diesels, is, is up eighteen percent. One of the factors that we run into that we've has caused us to increase, uh, ask for an increase, is the time to run a call used to take approximately an hour in Nashville, and now with the traffic we're experiencing again, we can't beat a call in Nashville. We we. we been at least two hours on a call now. Hour and 40 minutes to two hours on a call, which doubles your time and slows your driver's ability down to be able to uh, to run the calls. Our insurance costs is, is raised tremendously, mainly because of the injuries we've, that, that the drivers have had and the deaths that the, that the rollback drivers. We've actually implemented several different uh, requests that we make our drivers do when they're on the interstate now to keep from getting killed or seriously injured. Uh, some of the things that uh, that we're experiencing on keeping our trucks running is right now the, the death system, which is the after treatment system that purifies the fumes from the truck, the parts supply for them are, are gone. There's, there, we can't buy the parts for them. Some of our truck, we've had four trucks sitting for most of this year now waiting on parts and can't get them still. That's one of the reasons we have to have so many spare trucks just to be able to keep uh, the demand going. The after treatment systems, uh, not expecting to see the parts, they're to fill the orders for the dealers first and we get it to, after that, we're allowed to receive the orders. And of course, you know what that means, that we're, we're second to get any of the parts that come in, so it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to get the parts to fix the after treatment systems. Uh, engines are, it took uh, four months to get an engine to refurbish one of the trucks. Just to order a new motor, it took four months to get the motor in. Now that's just, you know, it used to be able to order a motor and three days later you had it on your dock, you're ready to go, but you can't, you can't do it anymore. Miller has predicted a 10% increase in sales, which they can't even supply the trucks now that we're ordering. They can't, they can't come up with them. I, order, I buy directly from Miller through, through Crouch Record Service and uh, like I say, I've got two orders right now and don't expect to see them this year. It's, it's difficult to complete the jobs now when you cannot get the equipment to do it with anymore, and, and which that means we're having to repair the older trucks more and more and more, which is getting harder and harder to do because the chips, the processors, everything we need to keep them running is not available. We're struggling. I, just to get one of my trucks running the other day, I had to actually go and get a used part for it, which I don't like to do unless it's an emergency, but I, I had no choice because they were expecting six months before this part would be available, get a knock sensor, as simple as a knock sensor. Um, you know, the, of course, I don't even have to mention the, uh, the cost of property taxes. I know everyone knows that what we've, been, we've had involved in that, which, which starts soon. But there's many, many other things that go along with that. Uh, and I understand why everybody's had to go up on us because they're in the same position we're in. These are the main reasons we've requested it. Uh, and I believe they would be uh, you know, fully available that we, we need to have some kind of increase to make it profitable and be able to continue. Mr. Mitchell, there's, uh, I'm looking at the red line uh, proposed rate increase. I'm assuming that this red line is what you've been referring to in terms of what the increase you'd like them to go to. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, are you looking at the vehicles under 7,000 pounds? Yes. Yeah, if and it was 155, we're asking for 250. The uh, what is the um, it says when the use of airbags is required under special recovery circumstances and additional rates of of uh, currently it's 5,000. What is, what is that? Airbags are a system that we use to stand the 18-wheelers up when they roll over. Okay. In 
In other words, I have a picture of it in my phone. I'll, I'll try to get it pulled up here in a minute. Maybe one of y'all pull one up for me so I can show them. It's, it's really, you really need to see how this works. Uh, it's an airbag big enough that four to six airbags can actually lift a loaded trailer up to the point where the trucks can recover. In other words, they're so heavy and they're in position so bad that our rotators are sliding across the road to pick them up. So we can't stop. We get them up enough that we get the airbags on them. We air the airbags up and the airbags help them lift the trailers up, and then the trucks can pull them on over. It's, the cost of these airbags are like $3,000 a bag, and so you're thinking about rubber against metal now, how easy it is to damage it. it happens all the time. I don't think I ever come in without, at least every other time, without having to repair or replace one of them. Sometimes we are able to repair them. There are repair kits for them, which helps us some, but they can only repair so many times too. But it is, uh, it's not something that you have to do with every time you're out, but it's something that's it's a, about a $70,000 expense to maintain the airbags and keep them. If you don't mind, I'll bring this up. Okay, show you all this here. That's the orange of the airbags, of course, helping lift the trailer. Thank you. And as I say, it's not something that involves a car. This is just for the uh, big truck. All right. Um, Ms. Gonzalez, can you inform us what the what standard that we need to apply at the commission if we're going to make a recommendation about rate increases? Do they have to be deemed reasonable, or is there a, what's the? So you you're constrained by the same standard you normally would. As you correctly noted, this wouldn't be something the commission can just adopt because it is in the code. Um, we can make a recommendation to council, and um, council would then have to change the code by ordinance. Um, so when um, the TLC passes any motion, um, your obligation is to refrain from being arbitrary and capricious um, and to have um, more than a scintilla of evidence um, upon which to base your decision. Um, so we do prefer kind of like a best practice for you all to kind of articulate your rationale for your motion for the record um, uh, with reference to the evidence that's been presented to you um, uh, by the um, uh, people who have spoken to you or staff um, comments um, or um, written materials that you've received. Well, Mr. Mitchell, I, I know I've heard you explain, you know, pretty well why there need to be a number of rate increases. Um, could you talk to the storage fee? So it looks like you want to increase that quite a bit uh, from 40 to $100 per day. And I, I ask mainly because this is a, you know, this is in a non-consent situation where you've got a, a car owner or truck owner who's cars being towed, um, I imagine, and they may not know about it for several hours and didn't realize they've also got a storage fee. That's true. That does occasionally happen. Most of them pick up relatively quickly. You know, so some of them are, are just to, just left. They never come and get them, and that's where you, you lose tremendously. They never pay the tow bill. They never pick them up. You have to dispose of them the best way you can. Uh, but the cost to provide the property to store these vehicles now, finding an industrial property in Nashville, good luck. It is just unbelievable what they have to pay for a small piece of industrial property now, if you can find it. I, I wish we could uh, allot some more industrial property around somewhere because we definitely need it. I know the only thing we can be on is industrial property. You know, it has to be zoned properly for that. So uh, we, we, of course, have to purchase it or rent it. Most of the time, uh, I've, I've not had a lot of luck renting. Uh, usually every time I rented something, within a few months it's sold. And if I wasn't able to purchase it, it's, it's gone right out of money. You think you have to move again, and that has happened right. twice to me. And, and, that, and that's, that particular issue is one of the reasons we've had some merchant companies, I won't say the only reason they went out of business, but they were. We had, we've had some rentals that they lost the rent and couldn't find uh, industrial property, not again isolated, but it's it's very limited. 
on what's available in the county because we've been round and round with them get the get the maps out and look at for industrial and the IR zoning is it's it's limited it really is or and in a non-consent towing situation are the companies required to take the car to a lot within a certain area or they can't like take it out to the outskirts of the county not unless that's their where they're I mean they, they're they're all most of them are central or close to the middles they at least that's what they work for in some cases however uh, and I won't speak for David uh, Williams and cottons but for instance you know uh, if you go to cottons you're uh, you are out on Old Hickory Boulevard at the end of the county but that's where the the zone is. I mean he's it's in the zone and that's where industrial property is available um, and in the same way, you didn't mention the big equipment, and you did say rotator. Yeah. Now, rotator is basically a truck with a crane on the back of it. I mean, the way that's I would correct. describe it as a layman. But, I mean, that's just one part of the large recovery and the large cleanups now. Yeah. The fuel spills, the oil spills, the skid steers, the bobcats, the bulldozers, the excavators that's required to do the cleanup are, I mean, we, there's no way we can buy modern equipment. We have to old and refurbish equipment because it's impossible. This equipment is just unbelievably high. So we have to constantly maintain older equipment to do these cleanup with. Is if, if I told you what a new dozer or excavator costs, you, you'd think I'm kidding. They've just they've gone completely crazy on them. It's, it's so high. Mm -hmm. So all of our equipment, most of it dates back into the 80s and early 90s on all of it. We keep it maintained well enough to be able to use it still, but we still have to we still have to maintain it to the point where it's, uh, when we go out there to do it, we're not out there for days doing a one-day job. We have to be able to do them quickly. And I believe both companies are extremely good at removing these and getting the interstates open probably faster than any other companies can do it. Well, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Can, can I, Mr. Mitchell, can I make yes, a couple observations and ask you for your input back on it before you sit down? Yes, sir. You talked about truck prices up about 10%. Parts going from 5 to 7% increase, cooling up 18%. And then you shared with us a lot of things that were unavailable now. Driver shortages, tires are hard to come by, parts are unavailable, so you're keeping older equipment going. But when I did it random, randomly going through the request for the increases here, they're in the range of 42%, 44%, 67 for labor increases. We're not talking about a 10 or 15 percent increase. We're talking about, you know, the 40s to 50, 67 percent increase in everything. Some of them are, but some of them are not there. But uh, well, the, let's let's take this one here for record companies authorized to charge an additional fee for uh, windshield. It was fifty dollars, and you want three hundred dollars now. I didn't even <coughs> add that one in there. I was trying to take the, some of the ones, but most of them are from like 175. They're going up to 75 dollars. That's a 42% increase. Well, the winching, when why, it's that why? far off the road, it requires, uh, when it gets to that point where it's that far off the road, it requires something other than one of our trucks, like a skid steer has to go out there to do that. To I remove understand. it, it can't be done with just a truck thing. Why are you asking for roughly 40 to 60% increases on every on the fees when you're telling me that your your actual costs are, are more in line, like 10 to 10 to 20%? Well, I believe if you put together the increase of the insurance, the increase of the property taxes, the increase of the, the unbelievable amount of salaries that we're having to pay now to keep them in, just to maintain the employees we have right now, their salaries have gone up this year alone tremendously, mainly because of, y'all surely have noticed as well as I have, all the signs for drivers everywhere in town. Our drivers will leave us very quickly if we don't pay them enough to survive properly. So our salaries are up just a tremendous amount. What percentage? Well, just my main heavier drivers have gone up at least 25%. Just my main heavy drivers. Now, even my light duty drivers have gone up more than that with some of them. Some of the beginners, it's not, but, it's, but after they get experience, then it will, it, it, or they leave. And you can't blame them. They're out to do the best they can for their family. I've lost more employees in the towing industry than I lost in the automotive industry in one year in the whole life of the automotive repair industry. In one year. 
It's the hardest industry I've ever seen to maintain and keep employees. I've never seen anything like this. And I'll acknowledge right now that I have appreciated you coming down here many times with people who have had felony convictions and your willingness to put them to work and give them a chance because yes, there aren't sir. many places out there that give people who are convicted <coughs> of felon, felonies an opportunity to work. So, Well, you know, I, I've really been very fortunate in that area because I do keep a close eye on them when we do that, but also, you know, I try to pick the ones that I feel like really deserve a second chance. And from interviewing them, and I'll, I'll be real honest with you, I've got a few with me right now that have done an absolute fantastic job, and I trust them 100%. Uh, one I've just recently hired just, just to do my lot of work. Of course, I won't mention his name, but he has just helped my business more than you can imagine just being organized. Mm -hmm. And if I told you what he was in for, you would scare you to death, but he, he's just done a fantastic job. I want you to understand the reason I'm asking these somewhat hard questions of you is because, as you may have heard, we have, when we make our recommendation to the Metro Council, we have to have some rational, logical sure. reason for what are very, very substantial increases in fees. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I understand. Well, look. Well, why is why is the why are the record companies um, proposing a consolidated one rate as the recovery base rate for vehicles um, uh, over seven thousand pounds? A big part of that was to eliminate paperwork and confusion. Confusion of uh, this one was this and this one was this and, and having to figure it. He's tried to come to a set rate, and then in that rate, it concludes whatever we have to do to do this. So just like, just take the water recovery rate, just to get a diver now, which I, luckily we've got two certified drivers on staff now. You know what it costs to buy the equipment for a diver and certified diver? Just one diver is about 20000 just have well, his equipment. I, I meant the, um, I'm on page one, it, mm -hmm. it, it has a distinction between a towed vehicle, a driven vehicle, and a wrecked vehicle mm -hmm. currently. And under the proposal, you would just have one charge as a towed vehicle, no matter if it's considered a driven vehicle or a wrecked vehicle. And I ask because there's a, you know, currently there's a big difference in pricing depending on if it's a driven vehicle or, or wrecked vehicle. Well, if it's a driven vehicle, the tow fees doesn't apply to it. But if it's a, if it's a wrecked vehicle, it has to be towed. It has to be towed to be those prices. I don't think I've gone out and driven any of them in in a long time, to be honest with you, though. Uh, you know, really and truly, uh, I yeah. don't think I've ever requested a man right. to drive one in. Well, the, in the red line that is asked to be eliminated, it says that a towed vehicle is a vehicle which can be driven, but is towed to the lot anyway. Yeah. At the request of the owner. Yeah. yeah. As I say, uh, that's probably just some of the terminology that was in in the past because I can't remember. Can y'all remember driving one in? And I, then I driven cannot is remember driven driving to the one lot. in. Yeah. Uh, I, probably some of the old um, literature that was in it before. Yeah. Alternate because I can't remember driving one in ever. So mm -hmm. I've been doing this a long time. I've never driven one. To be honest with you, I don't want to drive someone's cars in because, you know, <laughs> you're responsible for that car. And then when you drive one, it's on the truck. It's called on hook insurance then. If you're driving it, you don't have insurance on that car if you're driving it. So the way we, only way we can drive it, we just went through this on a trucking company that wanted us to pick up two trucks for them. One of them, those truck trucks were driving, but they were in North Carolina. So they wanted us to drive one back and, and tow one back, send two men up the truck. Mm -hmm. So I said I requested proof of insurance on the truck that we were picking up. And of course, he didn't provide it, so I could not drive it back. So, uh, I, you know, my drivers have insurance on them, of course, but if they can't prove to me they have insurance on their truck and we get involved in an accident, guess who's responsible for that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and there's only about three companies that are insuring tow companies around now, and you've got to be extremely careful with this. But you do tow cars that are drivable, but the driver may not be available, or the driver requests that you tow it in That's rather true. than we, them driving, tow, right? Yes, sir. We tow, we okay. tow them if a customer requests us to drive to tow a driving car in. Yes, sir. It's it's. Uh, that's but that's not price. winching. Yeah, See, we won't be winching them then or anything yeah. like that. That's just driving. That's just your standard tow fee then. Okay. 
so just in looking at this and kind of moving past the rates, um, on the third page, you're talking about driver's permit required for drivers and driver's <coughs> helpers. Yes, ma'am. And um, proposing to eliminate the requirement that they have a Tennessee driver's license. Mm -hmm. We've asked to see if it's possible to have, say, uh, and I, I'm not sure that this is possible. Is it possible to have a, we're, we're searching for drivers. So you must understand the reason for that is, is it possible to have a driver uh, with a record permit from out of state drive for us? I'm not sure it's possible or not. We presented that and it may not be possible. Uh, that's just a request in our desperation of trying to find drivers. I spend approximately two to three hours a day just hunting employees every day, six days a week, just trying to get employees interviewing. My interviews start usually somewhere around six o'clock in the morning. Just trying to find, I've just never seen anything quite like this. How long has that been going on? About 18 months. Okay. Analogous to what many other employers are experiencing. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, just to hire, if we hire a fresh driver to put him through training, if we can have him tow his first vehicle, and of course, we've got to pay him while we're training him. Normally, you would be paying us to train him, but we, of course, can't do that. But if we hire a driver, if we get him to tow a vehicle in four to six weeks, it's a miracle, the first vehicle. It's a tremendous investment just to get one trained now. So we, we hunt through the different colleges and stuff that are automotive, diesel repair college that students that maybe have decided they're not interested in being mechanic, but they're interested in being a driver to try to uh, convert them into drivers and uh, train them at that point. Uh, we've had some success with it, not, not a lot, but some. Well, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to the issue of uh, Increasing emergency and non consent record rates. Mm -hmm. All right. At this point, we'll close the public hearing unless the commissioners have any further questions, and then we can deliberate on the issue. There, there is one other. Uh, they're also making a rule request, a rule, a rule change, which uh, is <coughs> currently the rule is. Uh, Effective November 14, 2011, the record vehicles will be lettered with the name of the entity operating the record. And I then it that. says no name or distinctive logo or another licensed company may appear on it. At, the at that time, there were no companies that, op that actually had an operator that may operate two or three zones. In this case, we've got three companies that operate multiple zones. And that's that has been an issue if, if I, you know, from, from I think a staff Last perspective, we don't really care. The, we just wanted to make sure it's identified. And if they're operating Keep multiple going. zones, what has been the practice, if it's a Cotton's it's call, Toe Pro couldn't go. So even though Toe Pro and Cotton's are owned by the same person and, the, and they might have a piece of equipment that's ready to go, they could, could take it. So I think it's just an issue. That would take a rule change. Thank you, Mr. Fields. And with respect to the driver's license, if I may, I, the only issue we ever have is just make sure we have very accurate driving mm -hmm. records. And that's... Historically, that was the problem. That's the reason it said Tennessee license. But uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, it's it's. I'd really defer more back to Miss Stillman to be honest with you, because they're the folks having to deal with it. the The biggest problem is just the way the documents come. As you know from looking at the records we have in Tennessee, you'll look at a Tennessee record and then you look at a Kentucky record and. And, and they can be very confusing, <clears throat> or, or Illinois, or California, or whatever. And we, we, we do have drivers, not just not just record drivers, that come in with out-of-state driver's license. And, and I think the other side is this ordinance was originally written in 1998, passed in 1999, I believe. And um, at the time, it wasn't an issue. And, you know, 22 years later, it, it, it may be an issue, and I think that's the reason they wanted to bring it to you. Uh, I'm very. I have mixed emotions. I don't. Again, I don't look back at still, and I'm not. And I'm not trying to put it on the spot. I think it's harder on staff when it's not all the same. That's the reason so many of our ordinances are identical. So it's easier for interpretation by staff and that sort of thing. So that that that's the real issue. I think we would have. Yeah, I could see the possibility of someone living in Bowling Green and working in Nashville. 
uh, what, what I was trying to envision is I think if you reside in the in Tennessee after 30 days you're required to get a Tennessee driver's license mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. establish domicile here but what about the person who Mr. Mitchell's able to recruit from Warren County or Franklin County Kentucky and they uh, come down here to work and they have a Kentucky license they can't get a Tennessee license and they would not be eligible for a permit. Or one. someone was willing to drive up from Huntsville. It's a long way. And on the back to the fare increase, yeah. these rates were increased when? You said three or I, four years I ago? I believe the last time they were increased was 2018, I think, was the last amendment when it finally got into the. Uh, is, that, is that what's showing at the bottom? I believe it was 2018. Okay. Oh, no, we're, we're, we're good. We're good. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I do have the same concerns that Mr. McNally has about just the, the, uh, the substantial increase across the board for a number of the rate increases um, I mean some of them are you know more than a hundred percent increase and uh, I haven't really heard enough from Mr. Mitchell uh, who was who I gather was speaking for CoPro and some of the other companies as well but uh, that would support from a economic perspective the, the need for such a large increase certainly if we heard from mr mitchell about a need for an increase and that's mm -hmm. suggesting that there shouldn't be an increase if that's what the commission would like to do but these are really uh, big increases being requested To you. Sorry, I couldn't hear. I was saying I was taken aback by that too in reviewing mm -hmm. the suite. I guess, Billy, I tried to look up comps in other cities and I couldn't it, find it, anything. It's very hard <laughs> yeah. when you start looking at record rates. Because right. a lot of cities don't, they don't regulate. Right. Some do, some don't, and they regulate them in different ways, so that was hard to do. I think everybody here is sympathetic to the idea that there probably is a need for increase with labor cost going up. But how do we ascertain what the reasonable rate increase is uh, sitting here today? How does this group do that? That's why I asked Ms. Costonis if there was a standard. It sounds like really the only standard we have is that our recommendation not be arbitrary and capricious, but that's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's not, that's harder than you thought. not a whole lot of meat in the bone on that standard. <laughs> it's like that abuse of discretion. <laughs> yeah, I would love to be able to send this out to a committee to study it for us and come back with recommendations. And I, I take what Mr. Mitchell says, <clears throat> great credibility. I've, I've, consider you a very credible individual and I've appreciated everything you've done for this commission but I don't see how we here today or even any other time can sit here and do a study and be able to come back with a, a rate increase that we can sit here and say here's here's why with real as you say meat on the bone so what do we do do we know what the rating the last rate increases were in terms of uh we, we could get them for you. I can look at that old ordinance. Yeah. Um, I could do that right now while I'm sitting here. Maybe. I'll try. I'll look that would be helpful. How was it for starters? For, for the rate increases? I think most of it, at least my, my memory of it over the years, is it was you, you looked at what it's the like rates were. 2018, then, 1036. And then you look at, uh, you had a very similar presentation mm -hmm. the last time. The, the, the cost of equipment, the cost of tires the cost of taxes the cost of rental and or purchase and i think that's the way that decision was made uh, 
uh, the last time. If if you want, we certainly can work with with the with the record companies, and um, and try to at least I think to look at other cities and see if there's any comparable see if there's anything comparable out there. But again, I think every there there's some intangibles and. and that, that you just can't, you know, because I asked some questions too. It was like the one that jumped out and they will remember the conversation. I asked, there was something here about boats. And I said, good God, $150 for a boat? And I think Mr. Mitchell and and Mr. Williams both looked at me and said, Billy, the last, and they were just about the same. One of them had a boat that was just a regular boat. It cost them $500 to get rid of it because nobody wanted it. They tried to auction it. Nobody came to the auction. So they basically paid a scrap company to come. They paid them, I think, to take it apart. They wanted five hundred dollars, which was amazing to me. And again, I'm not necessarily advocating prices, but I, I think I'm very much like uh, the vice chair. I, I trust their opinions, but I also want to make sure that that you're on solid footing. Right. So if if like it, you know we've had a public hearing and we go gather some additional information and work with them. Now, Mr. Mitchell's standing, so I'll be quiet. There may be a little bit more to our, our position uh, than a lot of people realize. I don't know if any of y'all traveled Briley Parkway and noticed the house trader was left on Briley Parkway. Of course, we were, we had to remove it. Of course, no one would claim it. We had to remove it, dismantle it, dispose of it. And that was a tune of about $2,200 when we finished that. Just cost, just expenses, not including the time lost to do this. That's one of them. Two now, boats. Who, who pays for that? No one. <coughs> no one? No one. So who calls you to come remove it? Metro Police, sir. The police do. <laughs> yes, sir. And you're yes. obligated to do it because it's an emergency? Yes, That's correct. Now, the next two, there's two more that, that just bring to my mind just, that I did myself was two boats. Uh, it was a 38 foot boat that we disposed of. That I, The only place it would take the boat was the Springfield. Um, facility. I actually towed the boat there myself, crossed the scale with it, and disposed of it. In the process of this, the reason I did it myself is so, of course, I wouldn't have to pay the men to do it. The other boat we had was 32 foot one that ran up the, the wall at Broadway Park. We fell off the trailer because it was being towed by an inferior vehicle. Ran up the wall. We were left with it. I disposed of it the same way. There's zero pay on we tow a lot of vehicles that do not even come close to getting paid for. But what do we want to do? Leave them on the side of the road? Or leave them on the interstate? Or leave them on Riley Parkway? Surely y'all have seen one sitting there that's set for a while and wild and wild. And one of our companies, the larger stuff, has to do this. that changed a number of the rates and then um, authorized amendments to it to be adopted by resolution and then the follow-up with the resolution in 2018 that changed a few more of the rates. So it looks like the 2017 bill, 2017-984, approved rate increases for towing and recovering rates um, due to an increase in expenses for equipment, insurance, taxes, and fuel. Um, uh, there was some confusion about a winching provision um, and then it says, whereas currently the maximum storage of any car or pickup truck removed from private property is $30 per day, and per the record company request to the Transportation Licensing Commission, which was approved, the storage fee should be increased from $30 to $40 per day to reflect the increase in expenses for equipment, insurance, taxes, and fuel, whereas amendments to 2017-984 may be approved by resolution where, yeah, that's, that's all the substantive portion of the recitals. I can look at the 2017 bill. Was that all that changed? Was the it looks like be? more changed in 2017. Okay. Wait, what did I just say? That was? 2017. 
Mr. Mitchell, I can't remember if I was present at the last time there was a request for us to consider fee increases, but, and I, like Mr. McNally, really appreciate your regular appearance before us. Uh, usually, um, I, I know how uh, time consuming that is, uh, and a commitment to, to regularly appear before us. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the, everything you're presenting to us today. I just, I don't remember having the same hesitation the last time. It may be that the increases were not as substantial. I'm sure that there are. Uh that that's your concern, and I understand why. But it, it's not like a that we get a regular increase every year. Which, you know, if y'all, some of you may remember, we tried to do that at one time where there was a small regular increase every year, and we wouldn't have to worry with this. But if you go this many years, and how many years again will it be before it ever changes again? And as everything changes in Nashville tremendously every day, as, as y'all very well know, just to, you know, if you're trying to locate a rental property for two drivers from out of state to move in and just to find uh, a three bedroom rental I think the cheapest we were able to find and neither one of the drivers would accept these properties was thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars a month just to get a very very moderate rental price of property for them to live on to start out with just to get rental property in Nashville is about two thousand dollars to find something they can rent for a three bedroom right now to bring someone in from out of state, you know, we almost have to help them in some way because we, we've we exhausted the sources in this area as fighting drivers. I mean, I, the other gentleman can vouch for us what we've gone through. Try to, if I told you how many ads we're running right now, you would just not believe it. And how many cities I run the ads in and how many relocation fees we do to try to get them to, to move in. I have never worked so hard to try to find employees in my life. <laughs> and I've been in business most of my life. Mm -hmm. So it's just, uh, I know it's a, the changing times that we're in right now, but something's got to change to make it where people enjoy working and want to work again because we're in a, we're in a struggle I've never seen before. recitals are pretty short and sweet. They mostly refer to the hearing before the TLC, which recognized that business expenses for equipment, insurance taxes, and fuel have increased since the record and towing services rates were set in 2012. So apparently before 2017, they hadn't been raised in five years. Um, and then it says the Transportation Licensing Commission approved an increase in record and towing service rates on June 22, 2017. So it might be possible to look at the minutes for the June 22, 2017 meeting and see more detail about what the rationale was for that increase. Did they lay out of what the increases were? Um, yes. In the body of it, like, well, I'd have to, like, reference the code sections, which is hard to do while <laughs> uh, apparently a $125 fee for something was increased to $135. A $135 fee for something was increased to $145. A $145 fee was increased to $155. Um, or two different $145 fees were increased to $155. But I, I can't without, it just refers to the sections of the code without yeah. cross-referencing tell you what those things are all for. <clears throat> Um, and Those then are another increases. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of them may have been decreased. It looks like. Um, well, for many of these fees are just occasional things that occur just every now and then, such as the airbags and and the winching. It's not something that you do with every car that comes in. Um, the general fees are, are you just your general towing is your main ones that we do that concerns you know most of the uh, citizens of Nashville that if they had to have a vehicle towed you can see what the increase is on it. Um, the, it says it does say that on 558.3 the three dollar and fifty cent per mile rate was increased to four dollar and fifty cent per mile. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at six fifty. I mean, there's a table with different kind of rates for towed and wrecked 
larger vehicles. But I don't know that I can tell what it was before because it's just substituted. B2E was increased from $3,000 to $5,000. So that's a pretty big increase. It's the airbags. One airbag is about $3,000, $2,800, dollars for one bag. Um, another three fifty or two hundred and fifteen fee increased to three fifteen for C one thirty five or a fee of thirty five increased to sixty for C two D so that's a pretty big increase. Um, one hundred and seventy five dollar fee for C three increased to two fifty. Um, uh, under G, $55 was increased to $75, and $140 was increased to $175. H. Um, well, let me ask you another question, Mr. Mitchell. What, what, went, what analysis went into your uh, uh, justification for the rate increase, the proposed rate increases? I mean, what kind of calculation did you do? Did you review your prior history with each of the types of, of uh, charges to see, you know, were you making money from, like, for example, the use of the airbags was a, a good example. You kind of, yeah. Uh, when you get to the point where your, your, your bank account stays the same thing every month, you're not making money. And that's where it got to this point. So, well, my question's a little more specific because yes. there's so many, you know, I mean, some of there's variations and, you know, line item mm -hmm. charges. So I'm, like, for example, let's just go with the real basic one. Okay. You're proposing to increase all towing and recovery uh, for a normal vehicle from 175 to 250. Mm -hmm. What analysis went into that proposed rate increase to, to present to us that we need to allow an increase to 250. Well, the highway patrol is nearly that much right now on every one of their calls right now uh, with 225, depending on where it is, any mileage is additional on it. That's one of the reasons. Also, the the general cost, we look at the general increase we had and the percentage of the increases we had, which is over 30% of increase we had in all of our expenses, not to say that the cost of the trucks and the repairs of the trucks is it's hard to determine the exact cost of it because we can't get them fixed. We've got so many trucks sitting now, we can't, we can't get them put together. Hopefully this will end soon. I, I sure hope it does because when you've got trucks that are just a few years old that are not operational and you're paying insurance on them every day, that, uh, you know, we hope that it ends quickly. But just, just things like the, the chips for the computers, we've got trucks down for waiting months for a chip for a computer. Um, that truck is zero profitable at that time. So you can't take your insurance off of it because what happens if it, something happens to the truck? It gets stolen or it gets uh, run into or anything can happen to it. So you still maintain your insurance on it. There's a lot of hidden expenses in operating daily, especially at these levels that uh, to keep you where you can maintain the service that we give. Have you been getting some relief from the federal funds for small businesses? We were able to one time uh, on wages. Uh, of course, that ended. Uh, we, we were able to at one time. That helped us. To be honest with you, we hadn't got that. I, I'm not so sure we'd still be operating. What I'm hearing here is that the rate increases <laughs> are to help you get through this pandemic and labor shortages that we're suffering through right now. Yes, sir. And I know the federal funds that were being issued were to help small businesses do that rather than asking the commission to raise your rates. That's correct. Yes, sir. So I'm wondering if you haven't already gotten some federal funding to be able to offset these labor shortages. We did get one. Increase in prices of various different things. We were able to get one little relief, which is the first relief I've ever ever seen in my life. Ever, you know, but we were able to get one relief that helped us with the wages, of course, at one time. Because if things do subside, 
I don't think you're going to come back and ask us to reduce the uh, the rate increases. Well, uh, that would be unusual too, increases. but you know, <laughs> but you know what? I, I'm not a greedy person. I would definitely be willing to to do anything reasonable. Uh, it's not a situation where if it did change, that I would not be in a position to do that. It's a little over 30 percent. It's like 31 point something percent of what it increased. I guess I'll, I'll go back to the chair's question. And I know you have to do a lot of factors, but you know, I guess in my mind, if most of these were around a 30 percent increase, then I could say I could make more sense of it. But it is the fact that some of them are close to 50, 60 percent. Yeah. Higher than what they used to, at least is where I'm struggling. With some and of those, like that. like some of those are just occasional. You like the airbags and, right. and, and the winching. Right. That's not something that happens, but just every now and then. And when you take the winching, the expenses for the winch cables and the winch motors and mm -hmm. and the time involved in doing it. When a, you send a gentleman out and the vehicle's 50 to 125 yards off the road, he's not out there a, a, an hour, or two hours. He's out there three or four hours to do this sometimes. And then quite often we have to send a skid steer out there to even get it closer to the truck so we can even do this. It's it's impossible so each to get of these all individually. Yeah, as those to what the expenses are for each. And for that's the confusing scenario. part of this is those are just occasional ones. It's not like say if every one of y'all had a tow, maybe one of y'all would have to have something like that rather than every one of them getting that expense mm -hmm. increase. It would be a general thing that just occasion occasionally happens. It doesn't happen with every tow. The airbags, we don't use it on every time we do one of them. Probably out of the last, I'd say out of the last uh, 10 recoveries that we did on the big trucks, we used airbags twice. And when you consider that the time to open the interstate, offloading a truck on the side of the interstate can take a day to two days, and if we can airbag, it can take two to five hours. And the decrease in the secondary wrecks that happened because of that wreck being on the interstate, the time we get off the interstate quicker increases, decreases the uh, chance of, of additional accidents tremendously. And believe me, I've seen as many as 10 accidents occur because of one wreck sitting on the interstate. But I'm also sympathetic to the individual whose car gets towed and his storage fee is going from $40 to $100, which is a 150% increase. Um, the car sits there two or, two, two or three days and they're up to $300 and they may not be able to get their car out. Yeah, that's, that's true, but it's most of them are picked up within two hours if it's... Um, and that's $100 for two hours. Oh, it's just no charge for two hours. Okay. Yeah. If it's three or four or five hours? If it's 20, up to the 24 hours, after the 24 hours it's, it's one day storage. Okay, so the first 24 hours is free? No, sir. The first two hours is free. First if it goes hours. 24 hours, it's one day storage. Hours. Yeah. Right. So, two hours, one minute, up to 24 hours is $100. We're not, we're not that way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I probably give more storage away than you could possibly imagine. Right. But I am sympathetic. Yes, sir. I, oh, I, to I, I agree. The person whose car is in an accident, yeah. they're in the hospital a couple of days, the family gets around to getting the car out in five days or so, and they're $500. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Yes, sir, it is. You know, it's a little bit of an incentive to, to come on and get them out of there, too, because we don't we advertise our prices. We don't make it, make it very clear that they need to be picked up. A lot of times but, but, we're quite but, often... I'm sorry, but often you're not thinking about the storage fee when you're dealing with a with an <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, so I agree. Accident. I agree. And the other side of it is if you got 10 cars sitting there in storage, you're making $1,000 a day. And that's just for the ones that are under 7,000 pounds. Yes, sir. Most of them all are under that. If you have 20, you've got, you know, how much a day? 20,000. And then there's the cars that are damaged, can't be driven, and you got to figure out what repair shop to get them to, which takes a day or two, and then insurance is... Most clearly, well, when we told fact, them, that I think insurance doesn't pay $100 a day for storage on, on a wrecked vehicle. 
usually we work with whatever the insurance is. Uh, hey, we, we work closely with the insurance companies on most everything. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, uh, yeah, and, and I'm obviously it's your right to discuss and continue. Uh, it may make some sense to allow staff to go back with the companies and let's let's see if we can gather some comparables and do some comparisons and uh, um, bring back our findings. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, the, the I only, hate to put, yeah. I hate yes, to put them off because, yeah. again, I think they need an increase again. There's always a debate about increases, what should be this amount or that amount. Well, I mean, the only thing I've heard uh, in terms of actual support for an increase is maybe 30 or 35 percent across the board um, to that would justify you know an increase and that's still a substantial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that probably in making that motion um, you might need some staff help in terms of because um, mm -hmm. you have this very specific section 550 right. To somebody you kind of have to go through and do the math and figure out what an increase of 30 or 35 percent would mean for each of these rather different kinds of charges in some cases um so um i mean i think you could make that motion to recommend that but you know it, right you might want to go ahead and ask to see the re like the rewritten red line at the next meeting and then kind of validate that yeah that's what you meant And I also think that if there's a recommendation coming from Mr. Fields and his staff, that it <coughs> one would have a better appearance on the record that we're that right. it's been looked at carefully and it's mm -hmm. coming from recommendation from the director. And again, sure. Mr. Understand. Mitchell, I've always appreciated your appearance here, and I'm not saying anything about it's quite your all credibility. Right, quite all right, but. You are the one that's going to benefit from this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Well, I, I hear that. And to have someone who can come at, look at the numbers objective. with you yeah. and come back to us with a recommendation, I think, would probably Garrett, go further at Metro Council than it might just uh, mm -hmm. with what well, we have to do. Well, we have to work with the emergency companies to uh, develop a plan if that's what the commission would like. That's a good idea. Yeah. And I don't think they'd require any action today other than telling me to go do it. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, do that. I think that makes a lot of sense. But it has been helpful today to explore this and look at it carefully. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I appreciate your time. We're more than willing to do that. Well, thank, thank you so much. Well, sure. Thank you. Mr. Fields, I appreciate your willingness to take that on in your suggestion. Mm -hmm. We're certainly glad to follow the will of the commission. All right, next is... Uh, we've got a presentation of metrics for future fleet increases or decreases uh, for SUMDs. One of the things when the uh, SUMDs or scooters, as we like to call them, and electric <laughs> bikes, uh, there there are a couple things that uh, uh, that need to be done. One, there are no metrics, and the ordinance requires the commission to establish a process by which fleets could be increased or decreased. Uh, and they also have a pilot project. I'm sure they'll probably want to make it all in, in one kind of. They have a pilot project. They've been working with WeGo and the Trump Department of Transportation. Um, so, they in original intention was come with a rule request today, and I suggested it may make some sense to have a conversation, very much like you just had with the emergency companies, to talk about what they're seeing as a way forward if there are any fleet increases and. Uh, and also that pilot project. And I think they're all represented. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us here today. It's, um, I'm Sam Reed. I'm uh, representing Bird. Uh, we have folks with uh, Spin and Lime here as well. Um, excited to be back in front of you. It's been several months since we've talked about our favorite topic of scooters. Um, in that time, we've been meeting monthly with the city, sometimes more often with Billy, uh, representatives of NDOT, uh, of Metro Police, with uh, WeGo as well, and something I want to uh, speak about here momentarily about that. We've been coordinating on messaging uh, to riders. We've been collaborating on, on big events like July 4th. Um, we've been doing our very best to respond very quickly to issues um, that arise, uh, and I'm here to report that ridership is, is very, very strong in Nashville. 
Uh, in fact, we've been sharing some of that with the city, and now they have uh, the populace uh, uh, platform in place to independently verify a lot of this, um, the numbers that we've been sharing. But uh, we looked at uh, cities across the world with uh, 500 scooters or less, and there's about 50 of them where we currently operate. Uh, and Nashville's number two in total rides amongst those 50, and number four um, in uh, d rides deployed per, per vehicle per day. So right at the very, very top of ridership anywhere in the world. Um, uh, the last time I w we were here, we um, increased the hours of operation of scooters from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. We'll just quickly report what we're seeing as a result of that. Um, obviously, uh, defer to Billy from what they've heard on the city side. But in terms of our rider incident reports, we've seen absolutely no increase in uh, accidents um, or incidents. Uh, in fact, our, our self-reporting on uh, incidents, you know, since we've had those increased hours, has remained exactly flat. It's, it's far less than 1% of, of uh, any scooter ride where an incident is reported. Understanding that that is not perfect, this, this self-reporting mechanism through the app. Um, but uh, certainly in terms of what we've, what we've heard from the city as well and, and from police, uh, we've not seen any increase in incidents. So the 11 p.m., uh, I think we sort of wanted to wait and see what the impact of that before revisiting that. And so hopefully here in the months ahead, that would be something that we could revisit given the fact that uh, we have had a, a pretty good record in that regard. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about, obviously, was the unfinished business that Billy referred to um, regarding the future increases and decreases. And, Boy, I don't need to remind this uh, commission that um, we the last time we were doing fleet increases and decreases, um, there was some issues with the way that that was working, I think, and that led to a lot of problems. Um, I think the, there was a, you know, we were increasing by too much uh, each time. Um, there was very little discretion, and I think a number of, of the members expressed that they didn't have the real authority to um, really can say yes or no. It was sort of, uh, you know, done by the, if we, if we met these metrics, then we would, we would be able to uh, have a fleet increase. And there was very little by way of sort of performance metrics, right, that how, how are we doing? Were we doing a good job? Were we being responsive? It was simply were we having the uh, right amount of rides, and therefore we would be entitled to a very, very large increase under the previous statute. It was 250 each time. I, I, would, I think we would all agree that's far, far too many. Uh, and so what we wanted to propose is both uh, a, a way of increasing and a way of decreasing our, our fleet sizes, or at least throw it out for discussion and get your thoughts over the next month and potentially look at putting something in place uh, at next month's meeting. Um, and what, what, we have, what we have proposed and what we've shared with the city, and I will share this in writing with you later, is that uh, companies would be allowed to increase their fleet by no more than 50 scooters at a time. Uh, upon an affirmative vote of your body um, if the company shows two things. One would be that the company is in com compliance with the current regulations of the TLC with regard to scooter operations, responsiveness, and other compliance measures that may be adopted by time to time, and that uh, a showing that our current fleet is not meeting rider demand because the fleet is averaging two or more rides per day of operation, uh, uh, on average on operation. And, and that number two, obviously, we, I think there's some flexibility in there, two and a half, uh, you know, uh, so potentially more. I think for the fleet decrease, we would, we would suggest um, something very, very similar. The, the decrease would, uh, could, could be done by up to 50 scooters at a time by an affirmative vote of your body if we're not in compliance with the current regulations of the TLC, including operations responsive and other compliance measures that you may adopt and we failed to correct those measures, and uh, a showing that the current fleet is over-deployed because we're averaging less than one um, ride per day. Uh, and so uh, that was what we wanted to present to you all, get your thoughts again. What our goal really is here is to reward good behavior and to punish bad behavior, which is sort of what we wanted to set up really with the RFP. Um, slow, controlled growth. Uh, nothing in here would require you to uh, let us to have all 50 each time. Um, nothing would be required, and here would, would require you to approve them. Um, it gives you a lot of discretion, um, and all of the numbers now would be able to be independently verified through the populist program. Uh, and so that was what we wanted to put on the table for discussion and see if there's anything that we're missing. You know, some of the other things we've talked about is, you know, where they can be deployed. 
um, uh, you know, would certain number of the each increase, only a certain percentage could be deployed in the downtown zone, for instance. Um, there's other things that we would be open to, but I think given the fact that we have a very high ridership here, it's something that we would like to at least consider as we now are sort of about five, six months into the first year of the program. Is showing as a number of rides per day. Yes, yeah, so it, it changes obviously on a day to day basis. Our ridership on the weekends is far, far higher. In fact, our, our ridership on the weekends, we can see five, six, seven, you know, sometimes during peak times uh, per day. Our, our ridership during the week is much lower, you know, more like in the one to two rides. Well, then per that vehicle. gets me to my question. You said that you were proposing to go up if it's one ride to two rides per day. That's per scooter, right? Yes, two, okay. I, two, and then, two and a so, half, excuse me. Okay, or two and a half, yeah. a little flexibility there. Or go down if it's less than one ride per day. Now, how are we going to measure that average of one ride per day? Because you just said it varies so much between the weekends and, mm -hmm. say, Monday afternoon. Yeah. What, uh, what are you going to use for your average? Prior 21-day average. Okay. So which, would, which would, you know, obviously have weekdays pull our numbers down, weekends put our numbers up. And I'm guessing that you probably are averaging more than one ride per day for this 21-day period. There's, there's no question. I think we would meet the So you're going to be coming in asking for additional 50, <laughs> not reducing it by 50. Right now, Based on sure. how things are going. Absolutely. But I think right. the, the context there is important, right? We're one of the highest ridership cities, like I right. said, in all the world. So it's, this is, um, you know, the, the pressure's on us a little bit to try to make sure we can meet what we are seeing a lot of unmet demand out there. And what is the period of time that you would be coming back? What, what's the period of time you're proposing to be coming back to ask for e either an increase of 50 or a decrease of 50 per well, year? Uh, so we would first have to, the, the commission would have to adopt the rule, whatever the rule is. And then at subsequent meetings, we would obviously have to put the, the commission on notice that we would, each individual company would like to, um, increase their scooters, they ask for no more than 50, uh, and then the commission using those metrics of which it adopts then would determine whether or not we've both fulfilled the demand requirement and the, are we in substantial, are we in you know full compliance? And again, with your full discretion to say yes or no. But would you be coming back every, p potentially every month or every year or every six months? Or what, what's, your, what's your envision? Uh, I mean, I think during this during the summer months, and if we see ridership like we've seen this last summer, then y yes, I would. I think we'd be we'd be back, you know, every month or two to have a look at this. Uh, but again, you know, the, the program restarts every year, so we're almost halfway through, um, and we're 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 certainly through our highest ridership period of um, of, of, of the year. Um, so again, this is really just a for purposes of discussion of how we're going to actually determine this rule um, as is you know, required by the, the RFP and the existing statute. How'd you pick the number 50? Felt that it was very, you know, 10% or less of our current fleet. Um, felt that it was something that you could <coughs> very much incrementally control. 50 is, you know, probably wouldn't be noticed. Um, another 200 would be. Um, certainly if it's each company. So it, it was really, I mean, you know, look, I've, I've been involved in this since the very beginning and wanted to make sure that we don't end up in a, a place where there's all of a sudden too many. Uh, and I think that's part, in part why we've gone through the process we have and why we want to be very, very um, deliberate and careful uh, as we contemplate any more growth, if at all. How do we take, you, you've given us one factor that you're proposing, which is the number of rides per day per unit. What about the other less tangible factors like community sentiment, um, scooters on the greenway, or, or the police input about that they're great, they're helping, or that they're not, and the input of like Bike Walk Nashville, um, which course. is favored scooters. Yes. How do we fact? What would be your proposal for factoring in those less tangible uh, considerations? Well, I, 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 again, I, uh, again, uh, Vice Chair, I think it's that's your discretion. Uh, you know, I mean, I think each each 
member comes with their own feeling. Uh, you know, we, we can certainly describe what we, we've done in terms of, you know, boots on the ground and facts and what our numbers say and how many folks we have out there moving things and what we're doing to educate our uh, riders. But if, if uh, your feeling at the, when we're requesting, you know, additional scooters, then, and, and you're not happy with the performance, that's your discretion at that point, right? I mean, I think that's what, that's, it's really critical, I think, that, that all of those things are factored in and, you know, I don't want to put too much of a burden on this commission, but I think you're, uh, you're certainly capable of, of reflecting the community sentiment. Uh, and that's why we wanted to make sure that we were building in that discretion to, into these rules. Because I was looking at some things like the additional uh, bike scooter lanes that you have coordinated with, with Bike Walk Nashville. Yes. And um, as a less tangible factor to consider sort of as a carrot in front of, uh, as a carrot to, uh, to potential increases. You know, what, the things that you're helping to develop in the community uh, that are not just connected to how many rides are you getting a day? Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that all, I mean, that our job to come here and say, hey, we're, we're doing innovative things to help improve mobility in Nashville, help improve compliance of ridership. You know, again, I think those, all of those soft features will, will play into your decision making. I'm, I'm mentioning a lot of those because I want to hear that uh, when you come in to ask for additional scooters. <laughs> well, you can bet you will hear about that. Okay. In fact, what I want to talk about next is a, an exciting um, pilot program that we're working on with WeGo uh, in terms of last mile transit. So, um, but wanted to make sure that we hear from, from others uh, so that we can uh, build in additional factors as we think about how um, fleets would be increased or decreased. But point well taken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and one thing that we've explored very briefly is um, the idea that we know the ridership is up on the weekends. So the question might be, is there a way to operate additional scooters on the weekends, then bring them back out on Monday? So they're, they're, they've been very um, uh, flexible in terms of the conversations that we've had. And uh, uh, again, the Department of Transportation uh, and Multimodal uh, Infrastructure, uh, used to be Public Works, <laughs> is, uh, is, is certainly interested in that. NDOT is very interested in, in, in the process of, of scooters replacing other kinds of transportation for especially short, and that's what he's going to talk about now, the, the uh, uh, first and last mile project uh, that we're, that they they asked to enter in with WeGo, and WeGo is eager. Yeah, and, and I think it, it gets to some of the points we're talking about. So when, when we see, when you're in a market where scooter ridership is extraordinarily high, you know, our, from a business standpoint, we want to meet that demand, right? And where we're seeing the demand is in the areas where, we're, where there's a lot of traffic and where people are, are moving around in, in short distances and want to get to place to place, particularly, um, you know, what we see uh, in sort of the latter part of the week and on the weekends. What, by having what is, you know, for, for a, a, a city of Nashville size, a, a pretty modest fleet uh, uh, based on our, our, our ridership levels for sure, we wanted to um, explore with WeGo and, and with the uh, Department of Transportation um, if there was a way that we could help um, with some of the last mile um, uh, connectivity that we see along some of the uh, major bus car corridors. Um, so if you look down what I would, you know, sort of the, the really busy ones, you know, Gallatin, Dickerson, Clarksville Pike, Charlotte, Nolansville, Murfreesboro, you know, going all the way out to Madison, all the way out to Bellevue and, and, and Antioch, you know, given our restrained fleet size um, and really what would be experimentation around ridership, um, it doesn't really make sense for us to put a substantial part of our fleet along those corridors today, uh, even though we believe there, there could be significant demand. And so what we've been talking to, uh, we go about, we've had one real long deep dive meeting with them to start talk about some of the logistics of how this would work would be, would be to set aside sort of a, 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 you know 150 units that would not be part of the city's overall cap and those units would be just specifically designed to be put out along transit corridors right near bus stops obviously in places where and part of what we've talked about is making sure that we're 
not blocking any access, and some bus stops that will work better than others. We want to make sure we're near either, you know, big um, uh, employment hubs, job centers, or multifamily housing concentrations, so that we can help um, be part of that last mile, right? I mean, the, the bus stops where they are, many times people will have mile, two mile walks, and if we can help uh, get folks to that last mile, um, we we would like to we would like to do that, and we could take these scooters out, you know, sort of outside of, the, of our normal system, uh, measure the ridership, um, really working in close tandem to, you know, move them to different transit stops, get an understanding of, of how they're working, and come back to this commission in, you know, five, six months and report, you know, here, here's, what, here's what we've seen. You know, we'd like to think that we'd be getting quite a bit of ridership, that we, things would be working well. We may find that there's not a whole lot of demand, but, um, you know, we won't know until we try. Part of what we would also like to do is really push some of our equity programs. Each of our, uh, each of the companies have a various sort of low cost option for um, folks that you know have a number of different ways to qualify for it. And part of the the um, that program would be really pushing those uh, those equity programs. So um, that's the the sort of overarching um, idea with WeGo, and the, really the. Uh, Obviously, for us, it's it's how do we you know position the scooters in this market as not just something that folks are having fun with on the weekends, but are, are tools to actually uh, you know get people where they need to go. Um, and so part of it is um, is trying to show that uh, you know obviously in partnership with WeGo, we've still got a little bit of work to do before we're ready to deploy. Um, but we wanted to give you sort of the broader context and uh, and. Uh, take any questions or any suggestions um, regarding uh, what that might look like. Uh, does it, uh, doesn't WeGo have an app similar to yours? It does, yes. Are you going to be integrated into their app? We can, um, and we've done that in many other cities. That's a great question. Um, so where they would, you would see on the app where you were seeing bus stops and bus times and locations, you would also see the locations for the scooters. Now, we, we, we Unlikely would be able to process payments through the WeGo app, mm -hmm. so it would. Here's here's where a bird or a scooter is. You click on it, and then it would then open the yeah. our app, so then then you could then take the ride. But yes, we we, we that is something we uh, talked about in our meetings. So your presentation today, Mr. Reed, was just to get us to be thinking about these issues. Are you planning to make a formal um, proposal for us to consider? Uh, yes, sir, Chair. So particularly on the first point on the fleet increases and decreases, um, that, that would exactly right. I wanted to get a little bit of feedback, uh, send, you, send you all something in writing here in the next couple of days, and then we'd like to come back and, and, and consider voting on that metric. And then obviously future months down the road, we would actually consider those fleet increases or decreases. Um, for the for the second thing with the uh, with WeGo, we, I mean, we certainly if, if we need to uh, ask for permission to continue down that road, uh, that's something I'm happy to ask for today, uh, with an, a, an upper limit to, if, if that makes you all comfortable. But that you know we would like I, I I I'd be surprised if we were ready to uh, deploy within the next month around that pilot program. But it's something that we're actively engaged on and working on. Um, and so, yeah, to the extent that, you know, we can, we can continue to do that and not necessarily need to come and, uh, and ask for um, additional approvals, that would be nice to be able to do, I think. So. Well, we've, we've had multiple conversations on this particular part, and I did participate in the conversation with uh, WeGo. WeGo, and again, I can't speak for WeGo, but they certainly, uh, uh, certainly seemed enthusiastic. The uh, RFP, uh, part of the RFP was anticipating that there would be pilot programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, pilot programs, at least the ones that I've been involved with, with in the government, the more nimble they can be, the better mm -hmm. we're going to be to be able to move quickly and to be able to deploy quickly or, or, or complete projects quickly. Uh, I have no desire to usurp any authority of the commission. <laughs> uh, you, you've got you can have it. But if, if there were a way to, uh, uh, to allow an upper limit of X number of scooters per company with, uh, during a pilot project that, you know, I would suggest it needs to be at least six months 
uh, which would take if we were let's say we started October 15th we would be you know coming back sometime after the first of the year it's it, it it's interesting from a standpoint if they're used successfully in those time periods it will be different than the recreational because that's going to actually be their downtime relatively speaking that although we do seem to be working pretty hard most of the year on those scooters but what it would mean is those people we they're going to be measurable our populist program which we have contracted with is going to give us the data and it is, I have absolutely trust in these companies there as the ordinance requires they're our partners I, and so I do trust them by the same token we're going to be able to validate that information the numbers that I've looked at are very similar to what they're showing uh, they are very high numbers especially on the weekends um, so you know, I, 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 we're in the NDOT, the Department of Transportation Inter uh, Multimodal <laughs> Infrastructure. Uh, it is very interested to see could this may have an impact in neighborhoods. Uh, we do have the equity issues. We're actually working on what would those equity zones be, and that's also another challenge that requires more than just us saying, "Hey, this is it." Uh, but uh, if there were a way, and I know I'm too long-winded, and I apologize. If there were a way to allow us to begin uh, operations of, of, a, uh, of a pilot program aimed at specifically, aimed at those first and last miles and in full cooperation with, with WeGo, helping identify, because we certainly can't say where the highest bus riders are. They can. They can say where they see pinch points and not pinch points. They can also see the places where it makes sense in some places may have high ridership and it doesn't make sense because there's not a place to put scooters yeah. mm -hmm. we also will have to work out to make sure we don't put 40 the same you know that they, they put 20 they put 20 and they put 20. so it, it's going to take a, a cooperative spirit and uh, i will say i believe i can say it without hesitation we have our companies in nashville are cooperating probably together at a higher level than most every other city in the country and i'd have to let them speak to that but they, they understand that they rise together or fall together. The issues for one are the issues for all. Scooters on the sidewalks are a problem. Scooters left where they're not supposed to be, uh, even those we've talked about this week in the river, and uh, which are very interesting statistics to look at. <laughs> not that many, but when you look at your map and you see, a, you see a dot in the middle of the river, you go, hmm. And, you know, so we're, we're exploring that with them. But it, 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 it continues to be an interesting process. I met with the, uh, my counterpart at the, at, from uh, Portland, uh, not Tennessee, uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, I actually thought that's who it was when he called. Uh, the, uh, we had a very productive meeting. He offered any assistance he could offer Portland is, is advanced from us from the standpoint of them doing it longer. They have more resources to work with. We, we have limited resources. Uh, but um, again, if there's a way to do it, and, and I think you can, it's just a matter of saying this is the, these are the outlines of the pilot, these are the numbers we would allow, and then take, let's go to the street, working with, with WeGo, working and with Metropolitan Police and others that would make sure we're in the right space. And, uh, and then determining on the front end, we're also working with the mayor's office of... Uh, uh, of performance measures and uh, to make sure we can actually measure those kind of things that we're looking at and they're they've been we made they're meeting with us monthly as well to um, make that happen so again I would ask you because I think you've got two agencies of government that would like to see it happen I, I'd like to get permission for them to proceed with the pilot uh, under very close supervision with their understanding that we can't exercise, the director can't exercise those emergency powers that have been given to allow me to say, nope, stop. And that's already available, I think. <laughs> yeah. So you're basically asking for a blessing that they can increase the number of scooters for these pilot programs over what's been already authorized. Only in the pilot project. Only in the, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. that's what it really comes yeah. down to. And that's one of the things that I've told them we're going to have to identify if they do up to 150. I want to see... You know, I know I've got one through 500 in, in this part of town. Mm -hmm. I want to see A1, A2, A3 in those other part of town. In yeah. other words, I want some separate identifications. I think they're going to be able to do that. Uh, they, they have really good technology. Yeah. I mean, I think that really is a, an interesting issue. I, and I think it's a great idea to do that kind of a pilot. Um, and I really like the idea of being able to look at some of that first and last mile stuff. I mean, I think that WeGo probably has decent data, on, for example, on ridership 
I know that those transportation folks look at where the employment hubs are, you know, employer hubs where, you know, multifamily is. I guess, you know, I, I do think it's good to have be flexible. I'd be interested in those data to say it looks like 30 here and 20 there. I mean, just, Absolutely. so is it 150? Is it 100? Is it 175? It could, it, it you know. could very well be. And, and, and again, I, I think from, from our, <laughs> the partnership perspective, is we will be reporting back to the commission because I, I know that this is a very serious issue in this community. And there's some very, uh, there are varied opinions on whether or not uh, uh, they should even be here. By the same token, uh, with the potential of making an impact on traffic and congestion in the city by some simple by by doing some simple deployments, we think pretty good. So we'd be happy to come back and report uh, what we find and do it regularly, and not just at the monthly meeting. We could certainly because it'd be public mm -hmm. record anyway, so we could certainly push it back out. Can we authorize you to have the discretion to work on the pilot pilot programs? <laughs> Can I read to you the language from the code provision that um, uh, describes the parent parameters for your authority on this issue? Um, so it was adopted in BL 2019-109 and it amended 1262-020. Um, and subsection C says in pertinent part, um, the MTLC... Okay, future post RFP increases in the specific operator's someday fleet size shall be determined by the MTLC based upon reasonable and objective criteria to be developed by the MTLC, including but not limited to an operator's ability and willingness to achieve the goals of this chapter. So that word shall in there to me suggests that you all are required to do it as a body, but... Mm -hmm. um, the, the goals of the chapter, I think, are then um, set out in the 17 criteria that informed the development of the RFP um, that are also in 12, 1262.020. And that would include, for example, the equity piece that you all have been talking about. Um, and coordination and cooperation by the scooter companies with Metro, the pilot, the potential operator's willingness and ability to perform with regulatory pilot environment in which potential solutions are tested under varied circumstances in order to determine best practices and approaches. Um, that last one there makes it, does make it sound like that we would have to approve even for our pilot program um, as opposed to just I, I do believe you have to approve. In other words, I think you have to say that you could have up to 150 yeah. or 150 or 100 or, or, you know, and it may be they would come back and they'd ask for more. But I think, again, based on what she's describing, I think you also say they must not be a part of the current, they would not be Correct. considered mm -hmm. part. Yeah. Can, can you tell me how many corridors you're looking at with WeGo? Sure, absolutely. And it's, that's great. It's a great question. In fact, I've got, I've got a map here. I'm happy to pass around. But I mean, what, what this is what WeGo showed. And this is based on bus ridership. This is the entire county. You can see these big dots are where they have a lot of ridership, right? And so these are currently areas we, we, do, we have no ability to serve today, right? So I think the idea would be is really to go into places that we've not explored at all yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so... The, you know, the, ma the main corridors out of town, Gallatin, um, you know, uh, Dickerson, Clarksville, Pike, Nolansville, of course, um, Charlotte, you know, again, places that we just are right. unable to serve. I occasionally will see someone that's been brave enough to ride all the way from downtown out one of those corridors. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what we would like to be able to do is to, to offer people another mode um, that we just, we can't do today. And I mean, mo a lot of these stations are far, far, far outside of the area where we serve today outside right. the, the 440 loop, yeah. right? So, um, I mean, so would you be thinking about piloting on all of those corridors? I think or you the ones with the highest ridership, for sure. Like three? Uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to this, get a sense looks, of... looks to me there are three or four that would really um, be prime, yes. And, and I'm, I'm happy to... to to share those with yeah. you and I mean, number of scooters on. matters, right? If you're going to be on 10 does. corridors, then... You know. It sounds like you've had some discussion already amongst the companies, and Mr. Fields said 
this pilot program with WeGo would make sense to start with 150 or 50 per company to, to see how that unfolds. That's right. Yeah, I mean, we, we started at a, a higher number and we've sort of, sort of settled upon, I think, you know, to start with 150 each uh, and each taking our, our each. Yes, okay. ju just for flexibility. And I think, you know, we do, I mean, it could be, I mean, we're, I'm looking here at, you know, 75, 80 bus stops and, you know, five to 10 mm -hmm. at each across three companies, you know, as a, uh, to see how it goes, right? And, I mean, and, that, and I think the, the variety of, of what we want to do, we, we clearly the large uh, hubs are going to be places where we'd, we'd want to look at. But we want to see the smaller hubs too to see if there's a rider, you know, see is there any need there because there may be more people loading at uh, uh, the Madison station, which I think right. may be their highest. I, and I may 500 have riders a day, yes. How many? But north of 500 riders yeah. a day. And so, you know, you go to a place like that, but you may also want to go to a place that's, say, midway out Charlotte that, that may not be, again, it may not be in Bellevue, but it may be in Bellevue where there's a ridership, but it's not. Uh, it's not maybe 500 a day. So I, I think as we as I looked at the ordinance, what we were trying to determine is where could we experiment? Where could we see if this really does make sense? Because frankly, and I've said this publicly, so it's no surprise to anybody, probably you know, when the scooter got here, they came to me and I said, nope, don't want them, not going to take them. <laughs> and over the last, um, gosh, has it been three years? Yes. Yeah. Close. Over the last three years, I've saw, I've seen, and I've learned that it's possible. Uh, and then you look at other cities, and you look at other countries, and you go, "What's well, more than possible?" The question is, how well do we educate the public? How well do we provide infrastructure that's available, not mm -hmm. only for scooters but for bicycles as well? How do we provide that to where it makes sense? And I just kind of think we have to. This might be a good opportunity to jump off the edge and let's see what happens. Yeah. And, and again, all. It, you're not giving permission for us to go and put a bunch of scooters out tomorrow. This is everything that we will do regarding right. this pilot program will be completely at Billy and, and uh, WeGo's discretion. And I would imagine it would start small and, and potentially grow. I think the, the 150 number was just um, contemplating yeah. some flexibility over a six month period yeah. of time. But if we were so. more comfortable with a lower number to start and then we can uh, report back in yeah. a couple months. Um, yeah, and I mean, so 150 is really 450. To total potentially <laughs> right again but yeah. this is these are not uh, you know I, I would be shocked if we all of a sudden, we're, we're all in you know a month from now mm -hmm. deploying at that full rate across the city these are gonna we're gonna have to identify these stations make sure we've got appropriate parking nearby get sign off from we go right so this is all going to be done very much uh, as a partnership not as a well let us just go throw things out and see what happens okay, speaking of um, parking concerns I know I see it they are your former <laughs> neighborhood, sure. you know, where some of the sidewalks are not as wide as in other parts of Absolutely. towns, and they do park them, and then it's they do get blocked for anybody with an ADA issue. So in these extra neighborhoods that they will now be in, what I guess what are the metrics? What are you all looking at to make sure that that is not the case? <laughs> that they do have parking, and some don't even have yeah, sidewalks, they, so I don't even. A lot of neighborhoods yeah. don't even have sidewalks. So mm -hmm. I realize we are fortunate to have and sidewalks. I, and I think that's <laughs> that's part of the challenge is is to what can we do? Uh, I'm not getting a whole lot of complaints right now, but the, they do exist because right. I don't. We see it. Um, again, I, I I think part of it is the experiment to see if it does work, and but if. If it's positive here and it's negative here, that's where the commission will have to come back and may say, yeah, it's really working well, but they're leaving them all in the wrong spot. You know, it goes back to, a lot of it goes right to the companies, their ability to educate the riders and our ability to help them educate, but it's primarily on their shoulders. And I think it's clear in the RFP process and the contracts that were signed that it's their responsibility to make it work. And uh, I, I, I hear you, I, yes. I, I don't have an answer. They may have some that they could respond to. The, the, I can tell you how, how we've envisioned it from certainly from Bird's perspective is we, we would go using the, the, the bus map, knowing what the ridership is. We're, we're in the process of evaluating all of these places um, and coming back with a specific deployment location that is that is, you know, takes into account, um, you know, size of sidewalks, uh, making sure we're not blocking uh, any sort of ADA mm -hmm. um, or, or creating any other uh, type of obstruction, and and getting actual actual sign off on yes, that's an appropriate place for you to put them, and that's where we will deploy, 
and rebalance them to every day. I'm trying to understand what the purpose is going to be. You're going to go to the bus stop. You're going to set up a parking area like we've done already for the scooters. So someone who rides a bus home from downtown and gets off to the bus stop, gets on a scooter, and rides at that last mile home? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they drop their scooter off at their house? And we'll, we come pick and it up. You come pick it up. Okay. Or another rider rides it. Much like you have the independent people who have the trucks and whatnot that ride around, pick up the scooters, and take them home, charge them, and then bring them back to their That's correct. place of origin again. Okay. Now, how does it work the other way? I get out of the door of my house. I got to take that first mile to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. Where's my scooter? Yeah. So th these are the th these are the challenges that we'll have to work on. We, we we've got into some of this. Um, I think we, you know we will know ridership. I like numbers. the idea of leaving it at home. Well, let <laughs> me plug it in. That's absolutely something that we, that we could do. Right? Yeah, because I'm looking at that first mile to get to the bus. That's right. Because you know there's no scooter at my house. That's right. Um, the there's it could certainly and what am I stay gonna do? leave it right there at my driveway and then your person your independent person is going to come by pick and More I'm likely not, I'm not, your apartment complex somebody's going to come by and pick it up and um, take it back to their garage and charge them and then bring them back to the bus stop right so with the with our newest model scooters I mean they yeah. can ride seven eight nine rides I mean they have a pretty good battery power so mm -hmm. I think again these, these are the details that we're going to have to work out as we get into it certainly we don't want to take somebody's scooter away that they're going to use the next morning uh, and part of the part of why this is important is to sort of figure out how how we work through that issue maybe yeah, I'm just trying to envision absolutely what this what this goal is with we go yeah I mean it, it's I think it's to um, offer people an alternative from having to walk, you know, two miles from a bus stop uh, and potentially... Well, for instance, out there in Bellevue at the bus stop that's there at the recycling center, there's a large parking lot, and people drive from their homes and park there right. and get on the bus and ride downtown. Mm -hmm. It's an express route, and then they catch it back at five thirty, six o'clock and get in their car and drive home. And I'm just trying to envision using that scooter instead of their car yeah, that's right. on, on good days. That's right. That's I right. doubt anybody's going to want to do it in the rain. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, no, and that's exactly what the, the goal is to figure yeah. this out, right? And, and, um, but then starting in the morning, yes. so you don't take your car out of the garage, where's my scooter? We do have, I mean, so one of the things we can do is we can, we can rent you a scooter um, on, a, on a monthly basis. Uh, we can... Um, we can put scooters in other locations uh, based on if someone requests one. Are you renting scooters now for, on a monthly basis? You can do that, yes, through, through our program. Is yes. that part of the 500 we've authorized? No, not in my understanding, but I, I, I don't know how many of those customers we have here. I'm not aware. Okay. Um, but it, you can rent your own with your own lock, uh, and it, it works through the app on your phone. You can lock it, and you're the only one that can access it. And, and I could be correct. I'd be happy to be corrected. The rebalancing process in terms of moving scooters after they're used and back and forth, charge and so forth, if those batteries are still available, uh, they have a, the, the time period, I think, is 48 hours that a scooter is supposed to be, uh, can't be stationary more than 48 hours. That is correct. So if a scooter were to sit in front of your house from the night, if, if they know that it's part of this pilot, and it would be, and they're parked at, in front of your house, and they know the next day that you, it disappears back down here, and they can track it, and they would be, at that point they would know, wait a minute, we've got, there's a, there's a, uh, a person using it. So, yeah. so they don't necessarily have to move them every day. Right. And I, in, in fact, we haven't gone to that detail. In my mind, I would expect them not to do a lot of right. moving mm -hmm. unless they're blocking the public right away or unless they're put on private property in, in an inappropriate way. Or it might be nice to, on the app to say, hey, I want to hang on to it till tomorrow morning. There's your innovators right That's there. Right. Yeah. You Sorry. just gave them an idea. You, you know, but the, the problem is, again, sure getting it charged up. But we're not here to fix all these problems today. <laughs> and we should also remember they're not necessarily going to be at individual private homes. Right. Yeah. I mean, they could be at apartment buildings. There's a lot apartment of apartment buildings in Bellevue now. <laughs> yeah, in other parts of town. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it, 
and, and certainly part of the pilot is to figure out how would it work. For an apartment complex, you've got 800 units, and you've got 50 people who want to ride scooters. If I were the apartment owner, and if, if I were my partners, I'd be taking, you know, look what we've got here. Maybe there needs to be a corral set here. Right. Would you be willing to do that? There may be, and then they come off the side. There's not the issue of any ADA issues. They're on their property. I, I, it, that's what, the more you think about it, and I'm seeing your, I'm seeing the, the light bulbs going yeah. off, the more you think about it, you go, well, if this happened and then that happened, then we've got success. So I think we're, I think we've now begun seeing what success could look like. Will it be success? I don't know. Yeah, I'd I like to believe it. That's a, that's a really good idea in terms of looking at the, where folks are going to their individual homes. I think that part of this is starting at the transit centers and then seeing where are folks going. Uh, and if there are, you know, big employment centers or if there are, uh, you know, big apartment complexes or, uh, and we're seeing frequent rides daily, then we'll, we'll want to we'll go both places, right? Um, so that's part of the experimentation here in, in, in areas today, again, where we, we have the zero service. From a legal perspective, I'd be worried about the um, assurance of the um, accessible path of travel on the sidewalk. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so I would think that um, it would be good for there to be some kind of solution. Um, like if the technology is um, specific enough to be able to see if the vehicle is parked on the sidewalk, um, those sidewalks in residential areas are generally going to be like the five feet narrow sidewalk. So if you leave a scooter in the middle, that's the right. whole sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And so and a lot of I've certainly seen that. And so um, a concern would be, you know, in terms of Metro's ability to comply with the ADA, which is our obligation legally. Um, but, you know, it's it, what is the solution to ensure that we can tell if we're leaving scooters in front of houses overnight that they are not improperly parked. So what do you need from us today? Well, if we want, if you agree that it makes some sense to start a pilot, then what I think we need to do, and I'll look back to, the, to our attorney, is to say you may use this many scooters per company uh, for a six-month period. During that time, you'll be reporting back to the commission. You'll be sharing data uh, and continuing cooperative effort in clearly that we go continues to be a part and uh, NDOT continues to be a part. Uh, and, and I mean, more than just, of course, we're an NDOT, but not just our part of it, the other, the, the planners and that sort of thing on this project. They, as well? They're generally aware of it, but they have not been a part of the planning process. Because again, we were looking more at the data related to the ridership. Yeah. I guess I, I'm Do I don't know every neighborhood, so. but the areas where there are not sidewalks or the streets are safe. And, mm -hmm. and just like you're saying, even the narrow sidewalks. Can tell who lives where. Is it safe to have them on there? <laughs> there is the wheelchairs She's there. Nice availability for them to I believe the regulations specifically prohibit parking uh, some D it's on the sidewalk, sidewalk if it's less than eight feet wide. <clears throat> I'm on a well, area. will you bring the sidewalks to some neighborhoods? And we'll <laughs> let you park on the new sidewalks. There you go. I, I had one question. Okay. Have you anticipate? have you thought about, will each company be on each route? Or will they divide up, like, one's on Gallatin, one's on Nolan's? We've discussed that. I, I've not specifically thought how that would work in terms of you're going to put ten, and this one puts three, you put four, and you put three. Um, Again, from the cooperation, I expect them to sort of work those details out. That if, say, it's 10, it, it's 10, in other words, because what would, would be an equity issue in the terms of where, how many each one could put at each place? Or, no, you take that one, I'll take this one, and, and go from there. And they're going to rebalance themselves, I assume, like, like everywhere else. Yeah. And, and, and it's not inappropriate, at least I don't think, if I, if, if I wanted to ride a scooter, and I'm not riding scooters, not because I don't like them, I've just got this, well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it, it, uh, it would not be inappropriate if I rode a scooter to my house to put it in my driveway. Yeah. And it might be inappropriate to go put it in my garage, but it would not be inappropriate for me. I mean, I, I, as a rider, I could do that. And you would see it just as well on the driveway. And the one advantage out in the suburbs they can see the scooters a whole lot better there than they can downtown. 
because the, the high rises downtown impede with the current technology. The technology getting better all the time. That's right. They're all they're, the technology much better today than it was three years ago even. Soon they're going to be able to know when that scooter's on the sidewalk and not allow it to stop, not allow the ride to end. They're either going to get it to the right place or they're going to keep getting charged. That is true. On, yes, on our, on our very next model, that's going to happen. That, uh, I hear they're all in the same general technology lane. We, we all have our latest and greatest equipment here in Nashville. Is, is lucky in that <laughs> okay, so one more question, because you had mentioned... You don't have it all. ...a way to distinguish, you know, I'm thinking, you know, bus stops over in Edgeville and East Nashville, if one of those you know, gets picked up, because there are still a lot of Airbnbs over there and tourists that ride them into downtown, mm -hmm. is there a way to distinguish that that is in addition to the normal 500 that would be in the tourist area? Is there a way to distinguish those and get them taken back to, and I guess vice versa, you know, I could see people riding them from the downtown area over to one of those, and that, you know, is, how, do you, how would you distinguish that? Which are part of the pilot and which are they, the they will be uniquely have. identified and sort of live outside the other normal scooters because of, because of we're going to we're going to want all that data, right? That's specific to the pilot programs. They'll they would live outside of the, the normal five hundred and be measured um, independently. Someone got and picked up on Gallatin you know, by somebody visiting and taken into downtown. You would be able to see that, go pick that up, and take it back to the bus stop. And as we see the scooters now, for instance, you know, quite uh, by uh, coincidence, if you see a bird on one of our maps, it's black. If you see a lime, it is a nice lime green. And if you see spin, it's orange. What we would very likely do just to make it easy is talk about different color, different colorations and that sort of thing for the, uh, uh, where they are very clear. Uh, and I think the other side of it, uh, I know Edgefield and East Nashville very well. It, it strikes me that there may be some places, even though there may be a ridership, from a piloting standpoint, it may be, we may ha want to avoid some things just to avoid bumps that we know are coming. Uh, because the inner city has many strains and stresses and challenges, we do not want to add any more strains and challenges. And plus, I suspect the bus stops in East Nashville, and, and many of them are closer to homes than some when you get to Bellevue or get out into Antioch or out Charlotte, out Dix Road, out Murfreesboro Road. So it'll, it, again, it's going it, to, I mean, it's like we're at, I'm asking for more work, and we're, you know, but the truth of the matter is it, it's, it's interesting to look at. So, Billy, how many scooters do you envision needing for the pilot program? I have to defer. They started out at 250 each. And I said, I think that's too many. And uh, they came to 150, and I said, well, what about 100? And they said, well, what about 150? And here's why. And again, they talked about, we, again, it goes back to that flexibility. Some of it, because they will, let's say the pilot starts tomorrow, I am confident they will not be able to deploy 150 the first day because they don't want to spend any more of their resources to over deploy. So what they're going to do is start putting them in places and see what do they look like? What are those numbers? Right? And see, and they will be looking at rides, right, you know, every ride. I, we do not see every ride. That's not part of the contract. So I can't see every scooter every minute. They can. So they'll be tracking that. And, you know, while they won't report specific, they won't be able to, I, I, they cannot tell me by car contract they cannot tell me specifics about that scooter, but what they can, and in zip codes and in neighborhoods, say, here's what we're seeing from this. We're seeing 14 scooters are going into this general area, and 15 going, and they're coming back, and so they'll be providing that kind of information back. And again, it seems like I'm speaking for them. I almost sound like I'm one of them, but again, <laughs> the ordinance requires this commission to be a partner to this. And we signed a contract, and you gave them a certificate, so I've tried to take that serious. <laughs> So, Is there a number you'd feel better with? Well, I was with you. I was kind of thinking 100, but I, mean, I, I like the idea of the pilot and, and the partnership with WeGo. I, I, I like the idea of it, but I also, you know, cringe in the more dense neighborhoods that have seen a lot of them and have finally seen some relief that they're mm -hmm. not sure. all over the sidewalks anymore and having to, you know, answer to 
right now there's 150 more in there and I realize it wouldn't all be right there but so I'm not saying I couldn't be swayed <laughs> I, I used to be our neighbor so I understand exactly what you're saying uh, if 125 Again, we're we're. <laughs> I think 150 is just fine. What do you think about? I think 100. Um, I'm going to make a motion. Do we need a motion? About 100. Do we need a motion? Yeah. Because I'm going to make one for 150. I think it sounds just fine. And like I say, bring those East Nashville sidewalks to Inglewood. Uh, so I, I move we give the director authority to start the pilot project. Uh, with 150 scooters for each company. Is that an appropriate motion? Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Is there a nay? No. Yeah. Did you abstain? I think I'm going to abstain. I like 100. <laughs> uh, I'll say no because I think 100 is enough. I say no. So we have a tie. Motion fails. Good. Make a motion that we approve 100 scooters and give the director the authority to engage in the uh, pilot program with WeGo and, and the SUMDs. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you all. We'll be back to report on those first 100 here in the next few months. Thank you. Thank you. And we Thank can always approve much. more. I mean, if it's, mm -hmm. the, the pilot's going well. They're coming back with well. 50 more soon. Yeah, anyway, that's right. <laughs> uh, all right. Can, can I ask? Sure. What are we doing about the first issue they brought to our attention about the um, metrics for their proposals to come back for 50 more eventually? Um, or is someone going to draft a proposal? Mm -hmm. or Okay. Mm -hmm. What does the RFP say generally about approving future increases? Is it so vague that to allow this kind of proposal to be made to us by the companies as to a, as a, as well, to a procedure? On the metrics or yes, the... Yes, as to metrics. So what's in the RFP is sort of secondary at this point since, you know, the RFP has resulted in the, an award. Right. This award has resulted in the contract. Um, and the contract, um, uh, among other things, of course, incorporates by reference, you know, the code and the existing regulations adopted by this commission. Um, so, you know, that kind of takes us back to the language that I was reading to you in terms of future post RFP increases in a specific operator, some defleet shall be determined by the MTLC based upon reasonable and objective criteria to be developed by the MTLC, including but not limited to an operator's ability and willingness to achieve the goals of this chapter. Yeah. So um, certainly I think um, uh, the two criteria that Mr. Reed proposed in terms of the, the kind of analysis of the degree of ridership for, for some D, um, uh, you know, is, can be, could be one of those including but not limited to, but the, the more important one perhaps is, is the compliance with the goals of the chapter, of chapter 1262. Yeah. And um, so all of the things that we have been talking about during this meeting are part of those goals. You know, ADA compliance is a part of those goals. Um, uh, ensuring equity and, and um, availability in all neighborhoods is a part of those goals. Um, doing pilots is a part of those goals. So, um, you know, uh, you're discussing all the right things, I guess, is what I'm saying. But, um, uh, Yes, I think that the division of that code provision um, would be that you all would actually adopt a rule with some objective criteria mm -hmm. for fleet increases and maybe for fleet decreases if, um, if um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the companies are not complying with the rules and the code provisions as they should be. So um, I, I think that is... Um, within your discretion and your rulemaking authority. Thank you, Ms. Kistoner. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Reed. We'll look forward to hearing thank your you. proposal. I will send on behalf of the company what, what I read out in writing to the commission, and uh, we'll be glad to get any additional feedback and hopefully back here next month to right. figure out exactly what that metric is going to look like. Thank you. Thank you.
Next item on the, on the agenda is under low-speed vehicles. We have two driver applications, uh, Moralia Cuevas and Terry Moore. Mr. Fields. Uh, when uh, Ms. Cuevas uh, completed her application, she failed to disclose 2017 uh, DUI charge in leaving the scene. Uh, she's qualified, but she uh, failed to list that. Ms. Cuevas? Not here. Morelia Cuevas? Apparently not present. Have we heard anything from her? Are we expecting anything? All right, it looks like we've got a couple options here. We can defer her to next month. We could deny the application. I mean, we could approve it in theory, but um, she's not here to explain why she didn't disclose the earlier uh, issues. I make a motion to defer it to the next meeting and give her a chance to uh, show up. All right. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Mr. Moore? Yes, sir. Mr. Fields? Um, in Makings' application, uh, I believe he disclosed everything. However, he had a, a very lengthy record. Uh, in reviewing it again, we believe that he qualifies. Again, again it, it's lengthy enough, uh, but uh, we, we wanted to make sure that you saw it. What is he applying to drive? Low speed vehicle. So, okay, uh, golf cart. Golf cart. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. You've already got a, an offer from Joyride, is that right? Yes, sir. There were a lot of things that were dismissed that are listed on his record, and from what I understand, he's not misrepresenting it. Yeah. So, and I, not, that, not that we're aware of. <laughs> and I have to, I have to give you a credit, Mr. Mr. Moore. You certainly did identify everything, even the ones that were no conviction and dismissals. And then a lot of these are also probation violations that he's listed. Um, I'm assuming there were some difficulties while you were on probation and you got violations and then you got back in compliance. Yes, sir. Probably all stemming from the original charge that you were placed on probation for. Right. Okay. So many, my observation is that many of these are not necessarily new offenses. Okay. What was the, uh, there's a September 15th, 2020 theft of $1,000, and you pled guilty to a lesser charge. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I, I was convicted of that, and I actually just served time for that. I, I just took a 45-day sentence for it. And you had another one in 2019. What what are the and then it looks like there's one in 2016. Uh, where were you? Were you? Um, where we? What are the circumstances of those? The uh, thefts. I had a substance abuse problem, and uh, well, I've, I've since seeked help for that and uh, completed a 90-day program for that, and uh, as well as a 28-day program. But uh, that, that was mainly the reason that I was doing the things I was doing. You know, it, was, it wasn't that I was a bad person per se. It was just I was doing what I had to do to support my habit, honestly. Where are most of these charges out of? Uh, Davidson County. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't look like you have any felony <clears throat> convictions. No, no, sir. But the fel you did have felony charges, but they were reduced to misdemeanors? Yes, sir. What were you stealing? Uh, just different stuff like electronics and jewelry, <clears throat> just little stuff like that from uh, Walmart. And I believe that there were, yeah, m mainly Walmart. And uh, one of them was a laptop that actually belonged to my wife. 
but it was mine as well. We bought it together, and I was charged for pawning it. Your wife charged you? She did, yeah. Still married? <laughs> no, we're going through a divorce right now, so <laughs> imagine that. Yeah. She dropped the charges, though? Uh, no, she didn't. She yeah. actually pressed them, but uh, they dropped it to a lesser charge. It was a $1,000 laptop, and they, uh, <clears throat> they charged me with a grand theft, I believe, for that. Right. I, I think that's the one he's speaking of from 2016, and uh, it was dropped to a lesser charge. Well, just out of curiosity, what was the item that you were alleged to have stolen that was $2,500 or more? Uh, what date was that? September 5th, 2020. Oh, it was jewelry. It was jewelry. They didn't have an um, exact number, like on, on what, I, what I supposedly had taken. <coughs> so they, uh, I, I think that they just guessed. Mm -hmm. there, there weren't any kind of price tags or anything like that. So, You got a good driver's license now? I do. Let me see it. Got an endorsement too. The F endorsement. What do you mean an endorsement? I went and got the F endorsement to operate the. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's it's legit. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. 2008, and then same in 2011, and then there was an order of protection uh, that was filed in 2011. One of those was a, uh, the 2008 was against a girl I was dating, and supposedly we, we had a domestic dispute. There wasn't any kind of physical altercation. It was more of an argument. Uh, but they did arrest me for that. I went and made bond on that charge, and uh, they dismissed it because she came to court and there wasn't any, there wasn't any kind of physical thing. But apparently, if you're screaming at the top of your lungs and uh, the police show up, they have to take somebody in charge for that. And the 2011 was a similar thing. Uh, a girlfriend that I was living with, it was a screaming ma match, pretty much, and we both went to jail for that, and I had caught some other charges that they just ran that together with, so I just pled out to it, that they didn't have any kind of, like, physical, <clears throat> I, I didn't batter her or anything, it wasn't, but I just pled out so I could get a good deal, like a plea deal on the probation I took. Company is going to what's the company? Joyride. Joyride. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Are they here? Yeah, you <laughs> so, and you're Sorry. comfortable with Mr. Moore? Um, yes. Oh, yeah, I'm comfortable with him. His his mom is actually one of our uh, bus drivers, and so. She speaks highly of him and wants to give him a chance to get you know, to work with us, so we're willing to work with him. Could you please introduce yourself? Oh, I'm, I'm Brian Dill. I'm the co-founder of Joyride. Thank you. All right. So your mother will keep you straight? Basically. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Would anyone like to make a motion regarding Mr. Moore's application? I'll make a motion that we approve Mr. Moore for the low-speed vehicle drive to a grant its application. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item on the agenda is under pedal vehicles. We've been asked to review the driver application for Dinesh um, Samat Samatane. Samarana. Samarana. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Please come forward. Mr. Fields. In, uh, making his, uh, in making his application, he failed to list the 2017 charge of doing drug paraphernalia. It, it, and again, it goes back to never and then failed to list. 
In other words, he never he put never under how many times? So I just I thought they were expunged. So and I didn't read that like you had to write down even if they were expunged. And I just thought that like I could put never, but I went back and listed the charges prior, and I got another fingerprint. So that was my fault. I just didn't read the paperwork right. Well, we need to read the paperwork. I know. I know. <laughs> So, because you thought it was expunged, uh, what was the disposition on the uh, drug paraphernalia case? Sorry, what was that? What was the outcome of the case? Uh, I finished probation, and uh, the tr the it says terminated on the paperwork. Mm -hmm. Mr. McNally, it was one of the deferred uh, judgment deferred, deferred yeah. the, the forty thirty five three one three. Um, did you, I apologize, it's taking me a little time to look through this, but did you list any arrest or convictions when you were asked to do that? I no, didn't. No, nothing? I didn't. Nothing? Didn't I see you were also charged with possession of drug parap or possession of drugs besides the paraphernalia? It's a possession and drug paraphernalia. I wrote both of those down the second time I went back and did it. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was the drugs? Uh, it was weed and cocaine. <clears throat> I'm currently four years sober. I, I got sober August 26, 2017. So I just picked up four years last month. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. How do you pronounce your last name? Somaradna. Somorano? Somorano, yes, sir. Somorano. I make a motion to approve Mr. Somorano's uh, application. All, uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is under other passenger vehicles for hire. We've been asked to review a renewing company application for a good friend global. Uh, good friend, uh, friend uh, global. Failed to renew on time. They are an existing company. They have, uh, they've just didn't, didn't renew. So uh, we, we treat them as if they're a new company. But I, I separated them out to. They have been in business. They're they fill out the application. They're in order. Uh, they just did not renew on time. Make a motion to approve a good friend Global's application. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Motion passes. We also have a request to review B Luxury Transportation uh, request to add JDL Investment Group as a partner. Yes, they've uh, they have applied. Uh, we had extensive paperwork. It was a it was a little different. Typically, we've we've not added a corporation as a partner or a or an investment group as a partner. However. At least from my searching of the ordinance, I couldn't find a way not. I mean, I didn't see a reason not to. Uh, and they provided the LLC operating agreement that shows how it exists and so forth. So the paperwork's all in order? Mm -hmm. We believe so, yes, sir. And the reason it's on the agenda, just for us to approve it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> And JDL Investment Group, we know who that is. That's the. Uh, that's actually the. The information is they're, they're establishing a partnership in the documentation that we pro that they provided. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to confirm it is an LLC. I see that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Didn't look good to you. Yeah, the paper. It's an LLC. It's, it's actually LLC. It's a. Uh, I guess you'd call it incorporated in the state of Wyoming. It's kind of different. Well, I make a motion that we approve B Luxury Transportation's request to add JDL Investment Group as a partner. Second. Well, just to be clear, JDL Investment Group LLC. 
All right, let me renew my motion that we approve B Luxury Transportation to add JDL Investment Group LLC as a partner. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. We've also been asked to review new company applications AM Transport One Inc., Bevy Boutiques, Jenny the Guide, King Transportation LLC, Moja. ULE LLC, Vera Transportation, and World Rose LLC. All those. That they are in order. We have a representative from Baby Boutiques here, I believe. She. Angie, come on. <laughs> Something's going just, on, Mr. Just Pilsen's introduce winning. yourself. Yeah. I want to make a point. Okay. Oh. Please introduce yourself and what you do on your other your other license or certificate you hold from this commission. The other ones? Mm -hmm. I'm Angie Gleason with Nashville Pedal Tavern. This is a company that has already cert they have a certificate to operate a pedal carriage. They operate 10. She's decided that she would like to open a tour service. It's going to be providing very specific and niche uh, operation, I think, mostly for uh, young women, uh, although I guess young men could come too, <laughs> but women. And uh, I, I guess the point I want to make, she wants to do it right. I'm very proud of them, and I wanted to bring that to your attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Thank you. I'm sorry? I said I did notice that. The yeah. Well, I, you know, it, it, <laughs> so often uh, some of the industries that you regulate, and I think you regulate very well, have uh, been given some adverse publicity. And clearly <laughs> every company that we regulate has a problem or two. By the same token, uh, we have companies that work to be in compliance with, our, with the ordinances as well as your rules. Uh, the fact she could have taken a little larger bus and gone on by doing <laughs> this specifically knowing that she would be subject to our, our rules and regulations of the OPVH ordinance and that's why she's here and she and she and Brian were the original folks that came in with the pedal carriages uh, back in uh, 2014 so <laughs> yep. I just kind of it was a point of personal privilege I <laughs> to let me say I'm proud of, of our operators that we regulate Thank you for staying the entire meeting. Yes, bless your heart. I'm just glad I got through on this one. Yeah. Good. Do we have a motion regarding approval for these new company applications? I would make a motion to approve uh, these new company applications for A&M Transport, One Inc., Bevy Boutiques, Jenny the Guide, King Tra King's Transportation, LLC, Moja, ULE, LLC, Vera Transportation and World Rose LLC. All second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you guys. Thanks Thank for you being here. Is there any other business, Mr. I did want to present your proposed 2022 meeting schedule. It will look very similar to what we had had this year in terms of meeting on the fourth Thursday. The deadlines that I would propose for all of your special hearings are again in the same order as we would have done this year. Um, the uh, we just like to get it early enough to make sure that we're able to work with the court system to be able to reserve the room. So uh, if, I'm just ask you to accept the schedule knowing that things change as we go forward. <laughs> okay, you can make a motion or is that just FYI? I don't. Do Teresa, do you think where they need to, should they adopt it? I mean, they don't take any action unless they do it by motion, but I mean, it's your routine schedule. I don't yeah. know that anybody would. I don't think we did last year. Okay. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Yes. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.